Is it true you were one of the first act, or were you the first active duty fi fighter pilot to come out and talk publicly about UAPs? Yeah, specifically active duty. Uh, I was actually active duty when I did first speak about this. Uh, David Fravor, Commander David Fravor, um, he was kind of the first one to, I think, come out and speak about this. But at the time, he was um, no longer in the military. Why is it that you were the first one to come out and talk about this? Because people have been witnessing this and observing these things for long before you came out, right? Yeah, that's that's my understanding of it. So, I mean, why was I, I you know, the first? That's a great question, I think. Perhaps I wasn't, just maybe I'm the one we're hearing about. But, <laughs> um, you know, from my, my position where I was, it was a little different because we weren't just seeing a one-off um, – object on the radar or on a camera and they never see it again and question whether you know we really saw it or not we were seeing this on such a regular basis that it was something that we were briefing to every time we were not only briefing to it but we were also informing others that did not have the proper technology to see them and we were notifying um, the general public essentially with our notice to airmen essentially broadcasting out that there were objects that we didn't understand what they were but they were essentially a safety of flight hazard so um, for me to speak about it, I, it was just trying to solve that particular problem. Um, and that's, that's why I spoke out of, about it. And there was just the day we're recording today, which is, what is today? The 13th of January. And I think it was two or three days ago, the report came out that there was now over 500 reported incidents of UAP sightings or UFO sightings by you, by like service members mm -hmm. or military members? Yeah, my understanding is that reporting comes strictly from the reporting mechanisms that have been created within the Navy and the Air Force. Um, and so, yes, they are seeing more. And we would expect to see that, uh, you know, assuming what I've been saying is true. Uh, an increase in reporting will lead to an increase in reports. Um, and so that's what we're seeing. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean the quality of the reports will increase and it will likely have more false negatives when we do have that. Uh, but generally speaking, um, you know, they're out there and now we have the agency to actually report them. And so we're seeing the data come in. Mm. I believe the New York Times, are, there was a bunch of articles about it, but the New York Times article, I'm sure you saw, but was speculating that a bunch of it was basically junk in the sky or weather balloons. And uh, they even mentioned, I think they quoted about the gimbal and the GoFast video saying that the GoFast video, the object was only going 30 miles per hour. Did you see that? I don't remember if they specifically called out the GoFast video um, in those articles, but generally speaking, you know, there are aviators out there that are talking about this constantly. Um, they talk to me about it and they tell me how this is something that they're talking about in their cockpits all the time now. Um, what they did express disappointment in was the fact that there were no reliable mainstream media organizations that they could talk to about this. Not that they're necessarily looking to go out and make news, but um, they are they are looking for an opportunity to tell their story. And what we're seeing from the mainstream media is just kind of the same old, you know, um, little giggling, little, okay, well, maybe it's real, maybe it's not. And these people are putting their careers at risk to come forward to talk about this. So uh, to have it blown off like that didn't really go over well within the to the aviators I spoke with. They're saying that the big mainstream media corporations weren't taking them seriously? Essentially, they, they didn't feel like they could go and have a respectable conversation about this. And we see that with some of the reporting we've had where they've essentially dismissed these sightings. And what that does is the exact opposite of what I've been pushing for, which is to increase reporting. If you're going to mock the aviators when they actually do report something, well, guess what's going to happen? Naturally, you know, some people are going to second guess whether they should report if you have an art, a news organization like New York Times, you know, um, putting things out that... Um, are detrimental to the safe operation of aircraft, right? We have to report safety incidents. And if we are if we are minimizing those that report it, then guess what? We're not going to have as many reports. Yeah. A Navy aviator seems like it would be the last person you would want to mock. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's that topic, right? We kind of did it to ourselves. Uh, it's a conversation where... Um, and it may not be pure mocking, but it's almost a defensive mechanism, at least what I've seen. People immediately want to laugh when they hear this topic. And I don't think they're laughing because they truly think it's funny. I just think they don't know how to react, right? And so they just burst out laughing and then they listen for a real response. And sometimes they're shocked when they hear one. Um, but I think that we're going to see people continue to kind of hold that that flag uh, of ridicule uh, until they convince themselves of it. I don't think that one thing will, sh will be able to show them that data and they'll say, okay, that's, that's clearly something interesting. I'm going to now... Um, stop mocking this and really pay attention. I, I see um, 
I see some of these people kind of holding on uh, for quite a while until they have real evidence to stand behind. Yeah, I don't see that. I don't see many people that that have that stance really. Maybe it's just the, the my sur people I surround myself with, the people I talk to. But mm -hmm. it's interesting hearing you say that because you know you have. I'm sure you know you deal with a lot of people that are still active military or still in the Navy. Um, so a lot of people that you talk to that are still active service are they the ones that you're referring to that that still kind of hold, are holding on to that stigma? Well, um, certainly I'll say in the military, but I think it's more complicated than that because now that there is a, a classified reporting mechanism for this, I wouldn't expect them nor would I ask them to communicate about it. Um, however, I do still think the stigma is there. Uh, the stigma that I was referring to primarily is on the commercial side. Since mm. they do actually have you know the agency to have a conversation about this, they really wanted to. Um, some of the aviators I've talked to um, have Got some pushback from their employees about speaking on this, uh, including cease and desist orders. Um, I don't think they're necessarily asking them to cease talking about UAP or UFO, but um, just generally talking about um, operations of the aircraft. I could see why they might have an issue with pilots communicating a safety issue publicly throughout without their filter. Right? Where are the cease and desist coming from? Just corporate airlines or commercial airlines. When there are pilots that are interested in speaking out, occasionally they have received cease and desist orders. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I'm interested. What was your take on that on that new report coming out with over 500 new sightings? Or was it 500 total or 500 new? I think it was 500 total. Yeah, well, you know, it, it's a good thing because we're going to continue to see those numbers growing, I think, as more people report. And again, that's only military. Um, what also kind of came out at the same time as the report was also a um, interesting PowerPoint presentation that was given to the National uh, Transportation Board uh, by Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, uh, which kind of fell up actually, I think the same day, which has some interesting um, information regarding how serious they're taking this um, aviation safety threat. Um, additionally, uh, we also have seen the release of even more of what they're calling the range Fowler reports. Uh, those are the actual reports from aviators who are they're, those are the data sets that they're generating these reports from, right? And so those data sets, I would I'll suggest, are much more interesting than the reports themselves. You actually hear from the pilots themselves about the mm -hmm. objects that they're seeing and why they're so confusing. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so for people out there who who may not be familiar, can you summarize your career as a Navy pilot? <laughs> <laughs> I'll try. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, it's really not that complicated. I. Um, I, you know, I went to four-year degree. Um, got you get your a, degree in a mechanical, mechanical aerospace engineering uh, from Worcester Polytechnical Institute. Um, my junior year decided that the degree I was going for um, wasn't really that exciting enough. Essentially, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had an internship that really sucked, so I um, I essentially changed my major to the aerospace and decided I wanted to go fly jets. Um, applied to officer candidate school, got in as a pilot. Um, and essentially, you know, the rest is kind of history. I just kind of kept passing tests and, and moving forward. And, you know, luckily the needs of the Navy were such that I was able to get the, the aircraft that I wanted, uh, which isn't always the case. Um, but yeah, I joined, um, or excuse me, I, um, got in the F-18 Super Hornet for the first time, I believe in, uh, 2011 in VFA 106 on the East coast. Uh, I was there for a year and then, uh, immediately assigned to VFA 11, the Red Rippers where I flew the F-18 for three and a half years and two combat deployments. Uh, once I was finished up with that, I went to Meridian, Mississippi, where I was an advanced strike fighter instructor and the T-45 Goshawk, uh, teaching people how to land aircraft carriers and dogfight, drop bombs, and fly formation, all that good stuff. Um, and that was, um, that was when I first actually spoke out about this kind of near my, the end of my time uh, in that instructor tour. And that was the last tour before I got out as well. So I was in for about 11 years. Wow. What's it like being a fighter pilot? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm still figuring it out. <laughs> um, it's one of the like, it's one of the most fascinating things. It, you know, they make movies about it and and there's the the mechanics of it. And just, it's just hard to wrap your mind around flying a machine like that and then landing it on this boat in the middle of the ocean. and. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's hard to grasp, you know? I mean, a lot of people in the military do kind of like mundane things that aren't necessarily as thrilling as flying in a jet, you know? Even people that are, you know, boots on the ground in the Middle East and stuff like that, it's kind of, it's just not as 
I mean, it's definitely terrifying, but doing what you were doing is just like on a whole nother level, it feels like. Well, I mean, I was very fortunate to be able to be in a position like that. Um, truly, for most of it, it's, you know, a matter of your own skill and how you can perform. Um, so in a way, it's it's um, unique in that um, it, there's just so much concentrated effort and focus on on applying the skill sets to the maximum capability of the aircraft and the weapons, right? We don't we don't go out there and fight at sixty percent. We're always pushing the envelope. We're always max performing the jet. Um, and guys on guys and gals on the ground as well are doing that. But when we're up there. We're very protected in a sense. Even going into combat, at least in the environments we've been in, we're not doing air to air combat. Um, and so my job may have been more thrilling, but I have the utmost respect for for the folks that are on the ground doing the mm. hard work there. Um, it was, you know, my great honor to be able to fly around in Afghanistan and Iraq uh, to provide support for the, for the people on the ground. That's essentially, you know, what I was there to do. What can you talk about as far as what you were doing in, in the Middle East, flying and like what sort of missions or objectives did you have and mm -hmm. how similar was it to the Top Gun movie? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, <clears throat> I was I was trained to do uh, flights like you see in the Top Gun movie. That's typically called like a high threat. Um, we would call it close air support. That was a pre-planned strike, which is relatively rare. But um, we do train to do low ingresses like that. Um, the reality is a little more complicated, however, because typically what we're doing is kind of playing chess while we're down there. We're not necessarily just trying to go as fast as we can towards the target. We're usually identifying things and, and executing tactics while we're performing down there. And to answer your question earlier, that's really what's so difficult about being a fighter pilot. Uh, it's not the flying itself. It's learning how to employ that weapon because that's what it is to us. Is we don't learn to fly the F-18 for very long, maybe a couple months. I think it's our third flight is when we fly by ourselves in it. So really? We're, we're trained aviators at that point. What we're doing is learning how to employ a weapon system. And it's very complicated to learn the tactics and the timings and the distances and all the all the things um, that are required to survive up there if we are to go into combat. So what sort of thing? So so what sort of targets yeah. are you going after, and what sort of objectives do you have? Like what like what's your daily what what is day to day life like on an aircraft carrier in the Middle East? Like are you spending your days and nights on an aircraft carrier? I'm assuming. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So once we leave, we're pretty much out there for um, nine, ten, eleven months or so, depending on how long it is. Um, but on a daily basis, essentially, uh, you're looking at uh, anywhere between eight and nine hour missions. Um, you're going to launch sometime between five in the morning and, well, I don't want to use times, but pretty much all day we're launching and going out in those missions. And once we fly out there, it's very complex to kind of get into the battle space. We fuel several times with tankers to get out there. Um, so it's it's quite the trip. And then once we're out there, um, really what we do is we get tasked to various um, ticks, as they're often called, um, troops in contact scenarios where... Uh, we have to buster over as fast as we can to provide support to those troops that are in combat. Um, and that either looks like um, us identifying targets uh, on our own with our sensor systems uh, and either requesting or having authorization due to the um, rules of engagement to employ on that, uh, or talking with someone that's on the ground or in some base somewhere that is identifying targets for us, and then we come in and prosecute them. Wow. And so that's that's the majority of what we do on a regular basis in, say, I, Afghanistan or Iraq, mm. or at least what we were doing. Um, however, a few years ago, um, we were also operating um, near Syria, and uh, there were uh, aircraft that were launched, and we actually had uh, one of our first uh, combat shootdowns um, since oh, really? the early 90s, not too long ago. First and, one since the early 90s? Mm, yep. Yep. Um, I believe it was a Syrian MiG that was um, essentially getting too close to one of the fueling operations, fueling tankers, uh, loaded jet. Uh, I don't know the, the specifics, but either way, so, you know, we were seeing a little bit of air-to-air -air combat over there as well, which is uh, somewhat unique. Air-to-air -air combat is unique, like dogfighting? It is. It's not something we, we do on a regular basis or train to at least over the past decade or so. Mm. Um, you guys yeah. more have like str strategic strikes from air to ground, right? Well, let me be clear. We we do train all of it like 100%. Yeah. We don't even prioritize one over the other. Okay. Um, but when we are in those operations in the Middle East, we already have air superiority. So we're not focused mm. on air-to-air -air combat. We're simply uh, deploying on the ground. Right, right. Not to say we don't carry. 
we do have the weapons as we've seen with that shoot down, but um, mm -hmm. primarily it's air surface. When you're training to become a pilot, how important is vision, like human vision? Like mm -hmm. what sort of, do you do any tests on vision? Oh, and, yeah. And what is that like? Can you walk me through that? Um, well, you know, I don't think it's overly complicated. It's just, is your vision correctable to 2020 and below some limit? Uh, my vision was not. I had to have uh, PRK, laser eye surgery. Oh, before really? Before I joined. Wow. I did one eye at a time since I was still in college at the time. Uh, so I could still see the blackboard. So oh, um, wow. I did that to correct my vision so I could fly. And it's pretty, pretty common. I mean, you can fly with glasses. Um, yeah, it just has to be correctable. Interesting. Yeah, because you're moving so fast and you have to make, I, I heard you describe it before, like when you're flying, you're kind of, you're moving so fast, you kind of just don't even have, you don't even have time to think about anything. You're just sort of reacting to your environment and just using your senses and your intuition to make, to make decisions. A lot of times. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, the, the, the trait of a good fighter pilot would be to overcome that to some degree and, and push that. Um, mm. There are, there are best practices and there are tactics uh, and there's standard operating procedure. Um, how do we push past that bubble to adapt to a, a real life scenario in order to, um, uh, engage the targets. Now in the air to surface arena, everything's pretty static and fixed. But when you start talking about large air to air battles, that's when it gets a little more art, a little less science. Mm. What are the biggest dangers of your job or your job when you were a fighter pilot? Oof, uh, probably crashing into the back of the boat. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, that's probably the most wow. riskiest thing we do. What is that like? How do you, how can you describe the difficulties and landing and taking off from an aircraft carrier? Yeah. So I, I guess the best way to describe it and so I was a, I was actually a landing signal officer, which means I was specially trained as a, kind of an authority to land on the boat within my squadron, the air wing. Um, I was eventually uh, trained up to a head landing signal officer for my squadron, which generally means that means I would go to the back of the boat with my team with an actual like telephone looking thing and talk to the pilots as they're coming in the land. And what we do is we train them to our voices so that if we give a verbal command, they immediately apply that command, whether they agree with it or not, because there are misconceptions, visual misconceptions mm. and cues that they can receive under certain scenarios. And that's why it's so important um, that they listen to our voice once we start talking over what we call the the ball or the lens landing system. Um, and so, you know, what is it like? It's, it's difficult and it's never something, you don't just get it one day. Uh, you know, I've seen commanders and admirals, you know, having the worst passes, just like the new guys. And so it's very much, um, it's very much kind of like one-on-one -on -one in a sense, you know, it's just you in the boat. And a lot of times you'll, at least for me, it was very meditative and almost um, serene, especially at night on these long straight ends when you can barely see anything. Maybe I can send you a video of a night landing that I have. Really? It's pretty cool. Yeah. You just see a, a speck of light in the distance for a while. And then it's just an aircraft carrier all of a sudden as we're landing on it. Wow. Um, but, you know, how do you do it? How, like you have to... It's so difficult because imagine if you were driving a car um, at about 170 miles an hour and, you know, three-dimensionally, uh, car is kind of easy because you can only go two ways really, but um, you need to drive this car within a one-foot, one-foot box or fly your head through a one-foot by one-foot box while you're in the cockpit going over the aircraft carrier at a particular plane. Your head needs to go through that one-foot by one-foot box in order to catch a three-wire on a perfect pass essentially. So about 170 miles an hour, um, you're constantly making corrections to the right because the aircraft carrier is an angled deck and so it's slightly moving to the right. So as you come down, you're making these little corrections, looking to fly your head kind of on that curve, you know, you're kind of curving down a little bit to fly your head through that that box. And that's that's essentially a perfect pass. Wow, man. It can be tough. Um, and there's a lot of risk there. Uh, flying a perfect pass is not what we teach. Uh, we don't want people to fly a perfect pass. We want them to fly a slightly high pass because that's that's safer. Because if you're flying a perfect pass, any any uh, descent is going to put you below glide slope, and that's that's where it's dangerous. Have you ever failed in doing that, or have you was every every single landing kind of flawless? Oh no, um, definitely not flawless. But fail? No, I'm still here. So <laughs> right, but I'm sure um, not every every failed attempt would be fatal, would it? No. So when we um, when we come in, well. I want to call it a failure, not the trap. So um, sometimes you do everything right and you just don't trap. So what we do when we come down is we immediately put our speed brakes in, uh, which kind of slows us down, and we bring the throttles all the way up. As soon as we touch down, we rotate. 
So it's almost as if, if we didn't catch the wire, we we're just bouncing off the deck, which is exactly what we do. If we do catch the wire, then it stops us there. And so if we miss it, we just bounce up and go right. around and do it again. And I, would, I don't know if I call that a failure per se, but that's kind of the, you know, the, the negative, uh, the negative example of a pass that doesn't involve a crash. Right. Yeah. That would be the best case scenario other than a catching the hook on the wire. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, the la the worst thing you'd want to do is like clip the edge of the ship and yeah, you don't want to take off your landing boat. gear. Yeah. What's the worst thing you ever saw on the aircraft carrier, like that, like with a with a landing gone wrong? Uh, I've seen a tail hook hit the back of the boat. It's called a ramp strike, uh, but it wasn't too bad. Um, it didn't explode, which was nice. I mean, because sometimes the hook it hits the back of the carrier and just, psh, you know the the metal shrapnel goes everywhere, but uh, that didn't happen. Um, my buddy ejected off the front of the cat. It wasn't a landing, but he ingested foreign object debris or FOD during the cat shot, which um, took out one of his engines. And there was a, a subsequent issue with the other engine as well. And they ended up ejecting shortly off the front of the boat. Really? Mm -hmm. They were pretty low too. His WIDZO weapon system officer in the back seat got pretty messed up. I broke his back in several spots and, you know, X, Y, and Z. Uh, he's actually flying again. I think he either was or is the... Commanding officer at XO of the Blue Angels now, actually. Wow. How rare is it for someone to eject, especially during training? <sighs> I don't know the numbers, but I'm sure there's a number calculated in hours of flight time. But I've witnessed, oh God, I think five ejections. You've witnessed five ejections. I've flown over two of them. The fireballs in the jet. <laughs> what? Yeah. Is this during combat missions? Or no, is... these are all training. These are all training. Mm -hmm. Wow, it was much man. more, much more dangerous in combat typically. But you yourself, you've never had to eject. No, nope. I don't think <sighs> I ever survived. My back, whew, it would have got messed up. <laughs> what are these guys? Did, did you ever talk to these guys after they ejected? And they explained? I was responsible for investigating some of these mishaps, really? so I had to interview these guys. Yeah. What What do they say? What is that experience like? That's it's a lot, you know. For some guys, I think it kind of depends. You know, I've they kind of like. I mean, in movies, they kind of gloss over it. I mean, it seems like you know something that when they do it in movies, it seems like the guys are always good to go. Yeah. So like, especially the recent Top Gun. What is he going like <laughs> 10 mock and he just like, walks into a diner? <laughs> we should all be so lucky. Um, but no, you know, I've seen, I've seen, you know, I say, I'll say varying degrees of um, response, right? You know, some younger guys are easy and happy to just brush it off and go back up. And, you know, they're guys that have families and stuff, you know, it can really shake them. I mean, these guys are getting almost as close to death as you can get and still surviving some of these times. I mean, uh, one of the cases I'm thinking about, I mean, they basically ejected at the ejection window, basically 135 degrees down, about 400 feet up from the ground, so essentially ejecting into the ground. Oh, my God. And luckily, they came out and they were able to swing at least once before they hit. Um, and they were fine. Um, but, you know, they had varying responses to how that kind of made them feel and their comfort level. And... I was, uh, you know, the Navy trained me to be an aviation safety officer. They sent me down to their uh, Naval Aviation Safety School for about five weeks. And that was my job. That was one of my collateral jobs as a pilot. If or when someone goes down, I go out there and I figure it out. You know, I no shit, clean the pieces up and figure out what happened and publish a report and then go into the manuals and try to make it so it doesn't happen again. Um, we had to do that, you know, a number of times. Every time there's a mishap, that's what happens. And that's why we say our, our pocket checklists are typically written in blood because uh, we usually fix the problems afterwards. Um, and I've seen that lesson over and over again. And I, I can't say for certain, but perhaps that was part of my motivation to kind of speak up about the UAP topic because it was just a matter of time for someone just slammed into one of these objects and we lost air crew. Yeah. So when was the first time you experienced one of these objects the first time that you noticed one of these things. Can you explain like what was happening before you saw them and then what was happening after you saw them? Uh, from what I understand, you had some new equipment. Yeah. So we got back from our, our deployment on the USS Enterprise in 2012 and we entered what's called a, uh, a workup or uh, excuse me, a maintenance phase where essentially we kind of give our good jets to the four deployed squadrons and we cannibalize some jets and we fix some stuff. And um, our jets were just so happened to be ready to be upgraded to a better radar. It had the cooling systems already installed and X, Y, and Z. And so eventually we upgraded. And as soon as we upgraded, we started noticing objects on our radar that we hadn't seen without that upgrade. And so we went from flying around with our APG-73 radar 
and we see our little sweep, right? And that, just like a radar you see in a movie. And APG 73, you call it? Uh, yeah, APG okay. 73. Okay. Um, and it's kind of like a. And is this the thing like the clock that goes around in a circle? It kind of, but we only we see it kind of just like as a box with a line. Okay. A box with a line. Okay. And so, um, you know, what, what do we see? We basically just see like a little icon, right? A little blip, and it tells us the speed and various kinematics about it. And that's what we would expect to see. We weren't seeing anything on the APG 73. Uh, we upgraded our radars to the APG 79. Big jump, uh, kind of like digital to mechanical to digital in a sense. Uh, much better, stronger, more powerful, see farther, all that stuff. Mm. Um, and we go out there and we'd see objects. We'd see things on the radar. And it's like, okay, well, you know, I just, you know, does my wingman see this? No, he has a different radar. I have, you know, so we, we, we kind of just thought it was some kind of error at first. We were seeing objects on a radar that weren't there with the other one. It was just a natural assumption. They were vulnerable, not vulnerable, but um, they were prone. There was always errors that are involved in things like this. And so we thought maybe some of those had carried over. Um, but, you know, long story short, we eventually got close enough to see these not only with the radar, but also with the uh, camera system that's on the jet, the FLIR. And so that kind of tucks in on our, our cheek pad here. Whenever we look at stuff on the radar, all our sensors go to that spot. And so as people were kind of noticing these and taking locks on them and our sensors would go over, eventually people were close enough to see that there was IR energy coming from those spots as well. What kind of energy? Uh, infrared energy. Okay. And so our, our camera system, the FLIR, shows us either just like a camera view or IR energy, heat energy. And so that's what you see on, say, the gimbal video, that black and white. Mm, he's, he's able to switch it from black to white, right? You can switch it from black hot to white hot, which mm. means the white is the hot that you see on the screen or black, just changing the contrast. Um, or you can go to like a full color mode, which is TV, you know, oh, it wow. doesn't show you heat, but it shows you, you know, what you look through in a camera. Uh, we typically fly with IR cause you can see better, you can see further, um, it's more prominent. And um, yeah, we were, we were seeing IR energy come from these spots where radar was dropping us off essentially. And so at this point we had to conclude that there was physically something there and we had to at least respect it at, as aviators and not, you know, get too close to these objects or just ignore them and fly around them because we thought they were clutter. Um, yeah, we were, at this point, you know, we were confident they were physical, though we didn't know the origins or even that it was overly remarkable. What do you mean confident they were physical? What does that mean? That if we were to fly through the spot that we, our radar was showing us there was something that we could damage our aircraft. Okay. Generally speaking, right? So, so what, what, what are the possibilities of, if it wasn't something physical, what would show up on the radar that wasn't physical? Well, there could be energy in that spot. Uh, there are, I believe, plasmas can be um, captured on uh, a radar and other things. You can have extremely thick clouds can return uh, radar signals oh, in the really? APG-73. And so even even uh, like uh, temperature inversions where the air is extra thick with the older systems could potentially uh, show you radar track files. So that was our initial assumption that there were some strange things like that. But now to have energy coming from that spot in the sky as well in a very precise manner, as if someone was shining an IR flashlight at us, we had to make the assumption that uh, they were physical at that point just for safety of flight. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Hostage Tape. Nobody wants to be a mouth breather, but the truth is 25 to 50% of the population habitually breathes through their mouths. I, like many people, learned about the importance of nasal breathing when I first read James Nestor's book. And I have actually been sleeping with my mouth hole taped shut for the past two years. And the problem isn't just snoring and sleep apnea. There is tons of science behind how mouth breathing actually is responsible for an array of neurological, respiratory, and even metabolic problems in humans. The nose not only filters bacteria in the air, it humidifies it, it removes particulates in the air, and gives you a huge release of nitric oxide, which is extremely effective in fighting off pathogens and viruses. Now, I've tried probably close to a dozen different brands of mouth tapes from Amazon, and they all suck. Hostage tape is the king of mouth tapes. It's perfect. It sticks perfectly, even if you have a beard, and it's easy to get off. You just put it, here, I'll show you. Just like this. Comes off easily, doesn't chap your lips when it comes off. Head on over to hostagetape.com forward slash concrete to get your year supply of hostage tape for a $150 discount, which equals like 55 cents a day to sleep better and be healthier. That's hostagetape.com forward slash K-O-N-C-R-E-T-E. It's linked below. Back to the show. When you saw these things, you mentioned you, you were flying with a wingman. 
What does that mean when you're flying with a wing? Is that that's not the Wizzo? That's not the person in the cockpit with you, right? Nope. Um, we we'll have one person in the back seat called weapon system officer, right? And then if we have a, a wingman with us, um, if we're a section, that's two aircraft uh, lead kind of trail like this. We'll fly okay. in formation like that and we'll okay. go do our mission. Once we get out there, maybe we'll break up. Maybe we'll be fighting against each other. Maybe we'll fly around as pairs and drop bombs. There's a million things we could do, but we'll okay. fly out there in close close formation. And once we get into the areas, we'll do our stuff and then we'll join back up and fly back as a pair. Okay. Is that typically how all missions are are carried out with with multiple jets flying in formations and planned attacks like that? There, there's never, is there ever a solo jet flying? There is. There is all there is. time, but I would say it's it's just as common to go out and to, we, we pretty much, it's just one of those things you might just go out by yourself, but there's plenty of two, two sections or singles or even four aircraft in what we call a division. Mm. Um, so just all of the above, frankly. And what is it like to, sorry, we're kind of go, I'm kind of like going off on a bunch of different that's tangents, okay. but flying in formation, like, oh. like what is that? How that's like, hard is that to learn? That's like flying at the boat. So. I, that's what I would tell the students, right? Because I had to teach them that as well. And it's the same power motions, right? When you do that as when you land at the boat. Because when you're on the boat, you have to ride a glide slope. If I add power, I'm going to start going above that glide slope. If I just keep the power there, I'm going to keep going, right? So I have to make what's called three-point power corrections. I have to add power, get myself going in the right direction, pull it back to kind of deaccelerate, then re-add power a little bit less to stabilize on that new higher glide slope. But every time... I have to make an adjustment it requires three power corrections every wow. time. And so when you're flying the ball the boat, you're doing this the whole way down, just very, very small. Boom. Actually, we'll leave our pinky yeah. up like this on the rail too. So we can have like a reference point where oh, we wow. are. And so when you get close, you'll be just doing fingers, you know, and moving the two throttles just with your fingers and using that as a reference point, essentially. But when you're flying formation, same thing, pinky up there. And now instead of your reference being the glide slope, your reference is the other aircraft. And so... If I am falling behind, right, I have to add power to uh, stop that deacceleration so I can catch back up. And then, you know, then I have to take power off to deaccelerate and then add a little bit back to stabilize where I am in that relative position. So three-point power corrections all day long. And if you're in perfectly clear skies, you might go out to a mile and do that, you know, in a transit position where it's much easier and the small mistakes and it's not dangerous to kind of look away for a second. But um, if you're in bad weather, man, you're gonna be a few feet away, potentially for hours. Uh, hours. It, oh god, yeah, it's painful. It's gonna be very painful. Holy <laughs> shit, man! My first flight into um, Iraq. I was I, I was on day one missions when our, our squadron got there. I was one of the senior lieutenants in the air wing at the time, and um, only one in our squadron, lieutenant anyways, that had been on a prior combat deployment. Um, and so I was I got to go in on day one, and um. <clears throat> um we had to go through a damn thunderstorm and not only that, but we had to tank in it. We were all running out of gas. We're in a thunderstorm. The tanker's there and you're, you're free fueling in the air. Oh yeah. In a thunderstorm. Yeah. <sighs> the very first guy, he could not get in the basket. He couldn't get in and he was getting frustrated. He ended up going below his bingo number, which means he should have already diverted. Right. Which is not good. Day one. Um, you know, we don't necessarily have like bases set up, things of that nature, but anyway, long story short, you end up getting in and just, just how it is every day. It's just something to deal with all the time when you're flying. You never know what you're going to get. Okay. Back to where we were. We, <laughs> you, you, first time you saw one of these objects, you guys were, you guys were flying in formation, doing a training day. What was the weather like that day? Um, well, let me, let me correct you a little bit. I don't want to, it's hard for me to say what the first time was because okay. we were seeing his radar. It never was like, okay. We're seeing them. We didn't quite realize they were real. And then, all right, they're on the FLIR. And, but then we did see them with our eyeballs. So this wasn't just like uh, the first time it happened. It wasn't just like this no. unbelievable experience. Like, nope. whole okay. No, it was just kind of like, ah, you know, something's messed up, right? The radar's messed up. And then when we're seeing uh, energy, it's like, okay, our curiosity is peaking a little bit. But, you know, your drive to survive and do what you're doing out there takes precedence over a lot of things. So This is 2014? Yep. Um. But we were getting more curious as we were seeing them more. And then eventually, um, one of my squadron mates, well, four of them, but two, one saw it. They were flying out in a section. So two aircraft, four people, um, again, in this kind of formation, mm -hmm. flying out to the working areas. And there's a single spot in the sky where all the traffic going into those working areas goes through. Cat point? Um, not a cat point, just an entry point. An entry point. Mm -hmm. Okay. What is the difference? 
yeah, what, 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 yeah, definitely. What is the difference? But what is the reason for that? So a cap point is a is kind of a tactical term that we use as a combat air patrol holding position when we're mm-hmm. looking for a line of defense against enemies. We might be holding at that cap point such that we give a command to push, and now we're attacking enemies. An entry point is just a administrative point in the sky that we all agree upon that is the safest way to enter an area. For entering only. Yes. And there's a separate spot for exiting. Same spot, Same thousand spot. feet below. Her. Oh wow. Okay. All right. And so it's one of the busiest places, you know, on East Coast probably for air traffic. Um, and so uh, they they uh, how almost, far offshore? The ten miles. Ten miles. Okay. Yep. Uh, and it's at like maybe twelve. Uh, I forget. Maybe it's like eighteen or nineteen thousand feet. I can't remember. Maybe twelve actually. It's been a while. But either way, you know, it's not like at two thousand feet. It's um. You're not going to be seeing Cessnas up there uh, very often. But either way, um, they were flying in that formation, and at right at the entry point, one of these objects went right between their aircraft, um, closer towards the lead side. Uh, the lead air crew saw it. The, the air crew and the other aircraft did not, which is not surprising because you're so focused in on flying formation. You're not, you don't have much of a uh, scan going on. You're not taking in the scenery. No. Uh, but lead does, and lead did see the object. And... Boom, right Who? down. Uh, the lead aircraft, lead pilot. The lead aircraft, okay. Yeah. And um, and they he just described it as a dark gray cube or black cube inside a clear sphere. Um, that's that's the description. And it went in between their aircraft, but I'd be careful when I say that because we don't know whether it was moving or not necessarily. Right? Um, I don't believe he had it on the radar. If he did, I don't think he would have flown through it because we knew they were physical at this point. Right. Um, I also just can't remember whether he had a right or not, but my assumption is he did not. Um, they ended up turning around and coming home after that. Uh, they didn't trust their radar anymore, right? And they're going to do a combat mission. or well, not combat mission, but, you know, like a dogfighting training set, something that requires a radar. So if you're not even seeing objects and almost hitting them, it's time to come home. Right. Um, but he came back and, you know, he had all his gear on in the ready room and he was describing what he saw, just as I just described it. And, you know, he's just like, I almost hit one of those fucking things, you know? Because we were all very familiar. We didn't have a name for them or anything, but we all were aware of them that, that they were a potential safety issue and, you know. But no one had seen one with a naked eye. Not yet. Not until this point. So now, of course, now we're all like, whoa, this is getting weird, right? Maybe there's some kind of weird drone thing or X, Y, or Z. I mean, he didn't describe any propulsion. There's no obvious lifting surfaces, but but hey, that's that's what he saw. So... We were kind of thinking it was a drone at this point or something, so we we submitted a, a safety report, um, a hazard hazard report, which is something you submit when there's a, a chance of a mishap in the future. Like maybe you got lucky this time, but next time you might not be so lucky. Mm-hmm. And this is a good example of that. And so we submitted out, and you know we were thinking, hey, maybe this is someone's classified drone program. Maybe this is um, who knows what, but maybe by submitting this report. Uh, they'll get the message that, you know, they're stepping out of their, their lane here and creating a safety hazard. Um, they, right? I, we, we assumed it was some classified program at this point. Of course, nothing actually happened. Um, I forget the total number of reports that are related to UAP off the East Coast in that period, somewhere around eight or 10, I think. Um, so it wasn't just our squadron, it was other squadrons that had this type of radar. Um, and, you know, over the course of time, we weren't necessarily going out and, you know, um, interviewing people or taking any type of data sets. But generally speaking, whenever we talked to, whenever I talked to anyone on the East Coast that was a pilot that had a sufficiently powerful enough radar and they had seen the objects, they described it the same way. Cube in the sphere. Really? Mm-hmm. Which is very unique compared to what Commander Fravor talked about. He talked about like a Tic Tac object. They didn't, it was not even close to what you yep. guys saw on the East Coast. Yeah. And I don't think there's going to be just one answer for a, this whole thing. But so there's no... So if I can recall, Commander Fravor talks about sort of trying to chase this thing, right? He was trying to chase it and the thing was mimicking him or mm-hmm. mirroring, mirroring his movements. Mm-hmm. And then he talks about the thing showing up at his cat point before he even knew where his cat point was. He knew where his that, that point was, I believe. He probably had it written down, but it's, okay. he hadn't been there. Right. Uh, well, from what I can deduce from what he said, it was like he wasn't sure where, like he didn't even know where he was going to be prior to where, like there was no way maybe the object knew where he was going to yeah, be. It's kind of like one of those things there. where you have like a bunch of waypoints and you're like, I know I need to be at waypoint nine, but I have no idea where it is. Right. Type thing. You know okay. what I mean? So it's probably like that type. Right. He, he right. clicked over like, hey, he's at your cap point. You know, mm. it's like, oh shit. 
the guy who who saw it with his naked eye and you guys were in the ready room and he was describing that mm -hmm. who who else was there and what was like could, like could you read the room like what what did you take in from the other people that were there and what were was their reaction to kind it kind of had a similar reaction to the look that everyone had on their faces when we watched the gibble video <laughs> it wasn't the same people but kind of had that like looking around with a dumb look on everyone's face like what the fuck you know <laughs> like, i mean the you know the commanding officer of our squadron was there four or five lieutenants like myself the duty officer who is always there it's always someone at the desk and he's the one on the radio with the planes welcome back and you know troubleshooting and stuff uh, dealing with issues of the of the day, which this was, and um, yeah, and you know, everyone's kind of like, you know, I was hit one of those things, and it's like, well, what are we gonna do now, you know? Um, and the answer was to talk to the safety officer and and submit a, a hazard report. And eventually, these the hazard report, you know, of course, didn't uh, change anything. It's more of a data collection mechanism than a proactive, you know, prevention mechanism. Mm. Aviation safety, like I said, a lot of our procedures are written blood. Um, right. But, um, yeah, sorry, I forgot where I was going with that. Um, did you ever see one of these things with your own eyes? No, I didn't. I looked, um, what would happen is crazy. And I talked again, I, when I didn't talk to people that had seen it, almost all the others had seen it, but not physically seen it, but seen it on the radar or had tried to see it, but couldn't much like myself. And so what that looks like is, okay, we have something on our radar. Maybe it's, you know, 20 miles away or some distance, not within visual range. Uh, as you get closer, you start to pick it up on your FLIR. You dial, you know, dial in your course and you're trying to have a 500 foot pass with it. All your sensors are slewed. Your radar is looking at it. Your camera is looking at it. Your weapon system cameras and, and sensors that are on your weapon, individual weapons are now all looking at it, right? All that information is getting pumped into my helmet. And so when I look out, I can see a box around where I should be looking. Right, and I look back at my my radar, and yes, I still have the object locked, and it's right in front of me. And I look over at the FLIR, and yes, I can still see the energy coming out of that piece of the sky, you know, very precisely. Right, and um, and then my sensors are telling me where to look, and we fly right by it within a few feet, and uh, or you know, a few hundred feet, and um, just can't see anything. And you don't see anything. No. Yeah. But then it's still in the FLIR, still What on the is radar. going through your mind when you see it on every single one of your instruments, but you can't see it with your bare eyes, yeah. your naked eye? <sighs> You know, I don't know. We didn't we didn't make anything of it in a sense. I mean, you think I, it was like a something's fishy with the radar, something's wonky with the mechanical no, instruments. At this point, it's it's inconceivable to us that our radar and FLIR and visuals would potentially be now not for everyone, right? Not not everyone, but for the cases that we did see objects, to be able to fool all three of those is interesting. Now, what you can do is you can say, okay, well. Perhaps some were physical and some were not, right? That's one way you could go down this. And bottom line is we just don't have the data for that, right? To, to say whether every object represented a physical object or there were only some physical objects and the others were, were not physical. We just don't have enough data to, to kind of make that assumption. But when you're flying around out there, you have to make the assumption that they're all physical. Right. <clears throat> and how long, how long did it take before people in on the boat when you guys got back and did debriefs or went over how many of these reports were there before things started to change well or did things ever change i i don't know how many reports there were there were about i think eight or so um hazard reports um that were submitted to the aviation safety center that were specifically referencing objects that were um I don't want to say unexplainable, but mm -hmm. not identified as drones or anything else. Right. Um, there's a lot of others that indicate it's a drone, but, you know, what else are you going to call it, right? Right, right. <laughs> um, but I, I don't know how many because we weren't really tracking it, right? And so then what did change, essentially, to answer your question, um, eventually the Navy implemented a reporting process through the UAP task force where they were... Uh, mandating, I believe, um, naval aviators submit um, reports upon landing of any objects that um, they witnessed. And it didn't go through the Naval Aviation Safety Reporting Method. It went, you know, to the UAP task force. And so that that is what changed. I don't know how many incidents there were before that, but the UAP task force report and now the ODNI report that came out shows that it's happening quite often. You spoke about I forget where, I, where which podcast it was, but you spoke about a moment when you were in the room 
and there was a senior officer, like a head, like a top guy who was reviewing it. And then he looked at it. He's like, mm hmm. And he like turned around and walked away. What yeah. was what was that? So everything we've talked up to this point has been off the east coast of Virginia Beach with no aircraft carrier involved. Um, in 2015, we started to prepare for our workups. Uh, or actually, maybe it was 2014, but it was right at the chain of the year. Um, but we left essentially on the, on an aircraft carrier um, to essentially get ready for war. It's called a workup cycle. We spend months on the boat and we basically do all that training from the boat just to practice like we play. And while we were uh, off the coast of Jacksonville, Florida, that's when we uh, filmed the gimbal video uh, that people are familiar with. And so, yeah, it's pretty intense. And there's actually bases on the uh, coast where they have um, called uh, red air, contract red air essentially, where they come out and test us, right? So they'll, day and night, they'll come out and fly out and try to like penetration test a carrier, right? While we're doing missions. We might be on like a training mission and then we might need to break off of that because we're going to intercept some, some uh, other red air fighters that have been launched off the coast to test whether we can intercept them before they get within weapons range of the boat or things of that nature, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, I mean, in one sense, it's awesome, fun, right? I mean, you're out there zipping around, intercepting aircraft as they um, try to, you know, break their way into the carrier. So it's kind of like... Um, Where are these guys coming from? Uh, various bases off the East Coast uh, near Jacksville. And I forget where they're, mm -hmm. where they are, but, you know, they just buzz right out there and they're essentially targets for us. Uh, and we do that for our air-to-air -air training as well. But anyways, um, we were doing an air-to-air -air mission out there. This is actually, well, um, interesting little tidbit. Well, I'll get to that after. Um, no, please. <laughs> I'll, I'll, at, right after I tell the gimbal story, I'll okay. tell you this little piece that doesn't get talked about much. But um, um, yeah, we going out, doing an air-to-air -air mission. Uh, the air crew that filmed the gimbal uh, essentially started coming back to the boat after they had run out of gas or were waiting to land. Um, you don't like just come back and land. You have to wait for the deck to open up. And so what that means is you, you essentially have to just slow down and do what's called like a max endurance profile flyer at a certain airspeed that maximizes your time airborne okay. versus being an afterburner in a dogfight. That right? burns the least amount of fuel. Or... Yeah. Okay. So if you're in like some dogfight training mission, you the boat, you're eventually going to hit a, a fuel number and you bring your throttle back and you essentially just hang out. You're done being tactical at that point. Mm -hmm. And so that's um, that's the position they were in. They're coming back, and they ended up seeing these radar contacts on their radar, and um, they initially thought it was a penetration test, as I had talked about. So they went over to intercept the aircraft, and they were looking on the radar and, and all that. But the kind of mechanics of it didn't really jive with what they would expect to see. Uh, it was too slow and performing turns that they wouldn't expect to see. Um, long story short, they essentially went to to stern convert. The, the object, which what that means is you essentially want to, if the object's just flying around, mm -hmm. you're in any position, you want to kind of arrive in a position like this. Right? Okay. You start and convert. And so what that really looks like in real life, usually you're like 10 miles apart. You make this big arcing turn, kind of come in like that. Okay. Um, and so generally that's what they were doing um, as they were trying to get closer to the objects. Um, what they saw, well, what they saw on the radar was one object, and then nearby were about five other objects that were flying in like a wedge formation. And so the wedge essentially proceeded along more or less a straight line, and then kind of got jumbled up and did a very tight turn essentially, and started proceeding in the opposite direction. Um, these objects that are in formation, is my assumption that they were the objects we were seeing off the East Coast on a regular basis. And I say that because they appeared on the radar similarly as what we were seeing on the East Coast. Um, there are ways that we could identify it, such as the way the objects kind of like skipped around a bit with the, what we were seeing on the radar. It wasn't like a perfectly clear radar um, representation. It would kind of skip around as if it couldn't really tell exactly which direction it was going, mm -hmm. even though it's showing it moving in a consistent manner, um, which is confusing. but. Um, but that's how we were able to identify them on the radar. Um, and these look similar, right? So it's an assumption that they were the same. Mm -hmm. However, the gimbal object we had not seen before, that was kind of located below the objects, I'll say, or maybe to the south, if we assume up is north. Yeah. But they're kind of like below the wedge uh, and following in the same direction, just slightly behind. And when the wedge made that turn and then rolled out in the opposite direction back in formation, the gimbal object 
uh, just kind of went, it just kind of was going one direction and appeared from a God's eye view that it just started going in the other direction with no radius of turn. That gimbal video was from a God's eye view? No. Okay. But what I saw on the situational awareness page, you hear the pilots referencing, that's a God's eye view. And so that screen, typically between our legs, we have one screen here. Okay. Screen here, screen here. Typically we keep the, the SA page down here and then we'll have our radar here or our FLIR and a different type of radar over here. And so the, the SA page takes all of our sensors and has a fused image. It's a God's eye view, 360 degrees around our aircraft, oh, okay. the aircraft in the middle. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. With map, color maps and all this stuff, right? So like, that's like kind of like the conglomerator of all the data. Right, okay, that makes sense. And that's a God's eye view. So this object, you know, you have the, the air, things here and then the other, the gimbal down here, these turn and then this just kind of, with no radius of turn, just start going in the other direction from a God's eye view. Um, what that turned out to be, it seems, uh, upon further analysis, was that the object um, did with a vertical turn, essentially like a vertical J hook. Whereas if you're looking from a God's eye view. So like that? Yeah. Very tight though, in like a few hundred feet. It's a reverse direction. Um, which I, you know. Yeah, which I, is not something you see a fighter jet do. No, certainly not. It takes <laughs> almost a mile for a fighter jet to turn. Wow. <laughs> um, but, you know, um, I don't think this was fighter jet size per se. I think it was smaller. Um, and I say that because our velocity vector, which is um, in the HUD, but also gets transcribed onto the FLIR, that's set to a, a, a size. Um, and we can set that in our jet so that if we're in a dogfight and the wings of the aircraft in front of us in our HUD are equal to the size of that velocity vector, it gives us a rough estimate of the distance of the aircraft. Okay. And so if I look at that velocity vector and we're 10 miles away and that object is half the size of that velocity vector, it gives me a rough estimate of the size. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what they necessarily had it set to, so I can't necessarily make a judgment on the size. However, if it was set to standard, just I don't have a number, but looking at it, it would it would be smaller than F-18 based on its relative size to the velocity vector. Smaller than an F-18. Mm -hmm. How long is an F-18? Oh, shit. Put me on that. <laughs> it's like 30, That's something you should know, yeah, right? Yeah, 30 feet, 35 feet, something like 35 that. feet long and the wingspan roughly 28. What, 28. Yeah, I, I, we're going to have to cut this part because I'm probably wrong. But <laughs> yeah, it's been Maybe so you long. can find that. We pride ourselves okay, in not doing stuff that doesn't affect us in combat. 56 feet? Ah, man. Wow. That's no, that's, that's the Hornet. Oh. So the Super Hornet is okay, twice you were... the size. Not not necessarily length, but it's it's a big aircraft. 60 feet. Yeah. That was way wrong. Whoa. So that's what you were flying. Yep. The Super Hornet. It Find some better same. images of this thing. It looks the same, but it's um, it's 33% larger overall. We carry um, different engines, electronics, and all that. Carry lots of weapons. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's incredible, man. So, you know... Um, so yeah, anyways, we look at that one. Look at all the look at all the bombs on the bottom of that one. The one in the middle? Yeah, right there. Jeez, that yeah. thing is loaded. Argum ER. Uh what? It's Argum ER. Oh, okay. Uh advanced um anti-radiation guided missile extra range. Argum ER. Um so that is something that you would shoot and that's actually not an F18 right there. Oh, it's or not. not. Okay. No. <clears throat> that is actually a growler. A growler. Yeah, and actually, well, I tell you what, that's actually probably a test one. What is the yeah, sickest jet that exists? Oh man, I hate this question. <laughs> <laughs> I I'm partial to the F-35 because it's just it's just the right aircraft for the digital environment that they need to operate in. You know, we talked about f flying and operating that? a weapon. That's a 36. Yeah, thir I don't think a 36 exists. There okay, this is a 35. Yeah, I mean, the F-22 is a great jet as well. I mean, mm -hmm. the F-22... Wow, that thing looks pretty pretty cool. It's like very stealth looking. Well, it is It is a stealth aircraft. It's a Gen 5 stealth aircraft that's designed for penetration. Okay. Um, like every, basically every fifth generation fighter is nowadays. Um, that has pluses and minuses. For example, the F-22, fantastic aircraft, lots of... Um, Lots of thrust, uh, ability to operate high and fast, and all the good stuff, mm -hmm. and it's stealthy, and all its weapons are carried internally. Um, 
But that also means the sensors on those weapons can't look out either. Uh, and so... What does that mean? The sensors on the weapons can't look out? So you build weapons, say there's one called the uh, AIM-9X, which is a IR-seeking missile, okay, uh, which we use to employ it in close range. It could also use be used for... Um, let's consider high off bore sight shots. Um, and that that sensor needs to be able to kind of almost look behind you in a sense to like find that guy. And if your weapons are loaded internally to your bay, it doesn't have the ability to do that. Mm. Right. And so there's some interesting problems. I know they've worked through them at this point to some degree so that those aren't as much of an issue, but yeah. no fighter is perfect is the point. And they're built for different things. The F-22 is no different and F-35 is no different. Both very different aircraft but both applicable in the modern warfare. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Isn't it true that when the that first, I forget the name of it, but the first, uh, that big triang triangular black stealth bomber came out, there was, I think the government was going along with stories that it was UFO. They were trying to like, they were trying to like push the fact that it was a conspiracy because mm -hmm. they, they hadn't officially announced it yet. Hmm. But yeah, so this, so this is the gimbal video, right? Mm-hmm. So okay. this is the object we were seeing next to the five other objects. Okay, yeah, yeah, go ahead and roll it. Dude, this is a fucking drone, bro. There's a whole fleet of them, look on the ASA. My gosh. They're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots to the west. Oh, I think, dude. So these are friends of yours. <laughs> it was so weird when I was, I'll tell you a sec. That's not an LNS though, is it? It's not. It is an LNS, dude. Well, if there's like Look at thing, it's rotated. Yeah, I, one of them was in my wedding party. Really? <laughs> I won't say which one, but one of them I, I spent most of my career with. We um, wow. We went through training together in the fleet replacement squadron when we first met. Um, so we were like in a five-person class together. Um, we trained together and he ended up going to the boat with me. He was like my Wizzo, not my Wizzo, but he was the Wizzo in the back seat when mm -hmm. uh, we went to do our night landings for the very first time. Oh, really? Um, and it was his first time landing on a boat because the Wizzos don't do that until later. But the pilots get day traps when they're in the advanced strike fighter training. So the wait with the Wizzo? They don't, they don't do the landing though, right? They don't. Right. But it's still like, this is like now they're like with another student. Right, and this my the student's first time landing on a boat, and now he's in the back seat. You know what I mean? So it's kind of like this big trust thing in a way. Oh um, wow! It's really his first. Like it's like all right, saddle up. You know, here's a guy who's never been to a boat before. He's doing it by himself, and you're right. sitting in the back. Oh god! <laughs> right. So I imagine it's a little nerve wracking. They don't have a stick. I mean, they're not pilots. So, right. They're just yeah. holding their breath. Yeah. So we did this. We did this together, and it was an interesting story. Um, yeah, I know that guy. <laughs> we're those two guys yeah um but um so we were going to do our first night trap together and the way we do that is we hold way back behind the boat up high and we actually when it's t our time plus or minus three seconds of our push time we have to be at a particular point in the sky as soon as we hit that a certain airspeed we go down eight degrees nose down uh 250 knots which is pretty aggressive that's like um i'm pretty sure that's aerobatic flight in a cessna theoretically but in right. 15 it's no big deal. We're coming down, and then at about 5,000 feet, we arrest our, our descent from 8 degrees nose down to 4 degrees nose down. And because there's something called the minute to live rule. If we're, if we're descending at that 8 degrees nose down, our rate of descent is greater than um, how much altitude we have left in one minute if we were to continue doing that. Wow. So, like, you're going to die in one minute if you don't, you know, change something here. So that's why we we bring it up a little bit. Um so what happened was, as we were kind of approaching that altitude where we start to roll out, we're down eight degrees, everything's steady, that's all good. But as soon as we start pulling, essentially, our mission computers inside the jet uh, failed and they started resetting. So what that led to was all of our displays going blank and resetting. Um, so not only, now this is a night landing, uh, so there are no external lights, I have no navigation, um, the jet's still flyable, I just can't see where I am. And this is just as I start to pull up, which means I've lost my equilibrium, All right? And so I'm pulling at one, one G, which means it feels like I'm sitting in a chair, but I could be upside down, I could be sideways, you know, I could be inverted about to hit the water, it just feels like I'm sitting in my chair, right? It's no different. And that's what's so terrifying. And the mission computers reset, 
we're pulling up. They come back and we find ourselves somewhere like this, you know, and then they go out again. <sighs> so now I'm like, fuck me. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm not like waiting for them to reset. Now I'm like looking for my flashlight, you know? So like I can at least like turn it on and shine it at my backup instruments. Uh, Cause there was no like real lights on those either. Right. And so um, I'm trying to do that while I'm fiddling with that, essentially trying to like somehow keep the plane upright. Cause there's like a layer overcast layer at 8,000 feet, which means there is zero light. If there's just no moon and just sunlight, that's cool. Like you can see the waves, you can see the ground, but when there's an overcast, like 8,000, you might as well have your eyes closed. You just can't tell. What is this? What is it? Night landing. Oh, this is a night landing. Yeah. I have a video just like this. What are we even looking at right now? This is a tiny, let's take Oh, oh, it's the aircraft carrier. <laughs> yeah. There it is. Wow. So that's, I mean, see how it's like black up there? That's what it looks like if you yeah. have that overcast layer. You literally can't see anything. So you're basically surrounded in blackness mm -hmm. and you lost all your, your... It's like I just went blind. Everything went gone and you pull out your flashlight in the cockpit and you're shining it on I'm your trying to at this point. Yeah, I'm like trying to get it out because it's strapped right here and I'm like, I'll just tilt it down, turn it on and then it'll be like... I don't Meanwhile, have to you don't know if you're about to hit the water, hit the... Where, are you above the water? You're above the... Yeah, you, in, yeah. Okay. it's all ocean below us. Um, we can't see it. Um, like I said, because of that overcast layer. So it was, yeah, it was just like, man, um, we 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 ended up, you know, the mission computers were rebooting again. They ended up rebooting and staying up that time. Um, we were somewhere like this, you know, kind of just floating there around like 3,500 feet or so uh, as we were kind of coming down like this, just slicing down like this more or less, you know? Oh my God. And so, again, we had a minute. <laughs> Takes about 10 or 15 what seconds. What is the to protocol? Reboot. If What if your instruments don't come back online? What What is the protocol? What is the, what are you supposed to do? Go to my standby instruments. Uh, okay. Yeah. And then fly that back, essentially. Okay. Um, so, so at this point, we, we declared an emergency. We were probably about four miles, five miles from, we're like two miles from actually like being on the pass. You know what I mean? Like being in that image where you like see the runway and mm -hmm. there's a lens over there. Mm -hmm. So we declared an emergency and that was the easiest landing. I thought it was gonna be very difficult and stressful to land at the boat for the first time. But as soon as I saw the landing lens and the runway, essentially the, the boat, I was like, wow, you know, I, at least I won't hit the ground because I know where it is now. And so everything else was just easy because I was just happy to be able to see, you know, see the ground essentially right. if they went out again. Wow, that's terrifying, man. So anyways, we did that together. <laughs> and then um, we ended up um, going to the boat and I, I was um, I was taught my class on the boat. They sent me priority alpha, which means I was deployable to, a, or I was I could be sent to a four deployed squadron um, just because my, my grades were high and then I did well enough. And so about two weeks after I finished that training, uh, I was sent out to the USS Enterprise um, and I flew my first combat mission about a week after that. Wow. And the gentleman I was just talking about, he actually got assigned to the same squadron. Oh, wow. So then we hung out for the next three years. We did specialized training together. Um, and then when I left, he left too. And he actually transitioned to be a pilot. And so he actually ended up in Meridian, Mississippi when I was an instructor there as well. No way. Yeah. <laughs> so That's, we wow. pretty much spent our whole career together. Um, That's yeah. incredible. Pretty cool. So this, that gimbal video that we just watched, it was only 35 seconds long. Mm -hmm. It was much longer than that, though, right? Uh, I don't know if I want to say much longer, but it was it was definitely more there. I, yeah. Why Why do they only Why do we only get thirty seconds? I don't know. I don't know. Do you have any any um, speculation why? Um. I mean, there you mentioned that there was like the the wedge shaped formation. Was that a part of this video? I never saw that, those on the FLIR, but what I did see them on was the uh, the SA page. Okay. Um, and that was primarily what I was looking on. And when I did look at the FLIR, uh, basically saw the same image that you saw, um, plus maybe a little bit more near the end um, as the flight mechanics seemed to get rockier. So it kind of, it kept kind of doing that, mm. that motion that you see that it kind of seemed unstable in a sense, but I, I don't want to put words onto it until it comes out because it has been like six years for me now <laughs> since I've seen that video and it hasn't, you know. Which one is this? Just the more of the gimbal essentially. The, the full saying. version yeah. of it, yeah. So yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I believe Christopher Mellon was the one who sort of leaked these videos and is the reason they even came out in the first place back in, what was the year that first came out in the New York Times? I think it was 2017. 2017, that's when it was, yeah. 
And, you know, he talked about in James Fox's documentary, The Phenomenon, how there's much more. There's these videos are much longer yeah. and they're yet to release the full videos for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Do you have any speculation of why they wouldn't release the full videos? Well, I, th I think it depends on your definition. So um, full video, um, the full video has radar data, right? So the FLIR and the radar and the situational awareness page are recorded at the same time. Not necessarily those two pages, but the screens that they're displayed on. And so if you have one, you have the other. And mm. so what that means is the situational awareness page with all the radar data, you know, it did exist. I don't know if it still does exist, but okay. you know, that's where you'd want, that's what you'd want to see because it has all the radar, the kinematics, and it's going to show it over the entire course of when they were detectable, whether they were directly looking at it or not. And so there is much more data to be had even outside of just the video. Mm. What does your buddy think? The guy, the guy who actually filmed this, the guy who was in your wedding party. Would you, do you guys talk about this often or? Uh, not some, not, not really. I mean, he's, he's still in, he's deployed a lot. Is he's he? very busy. So he's just heads down. Um, but no, not really. I'm, I'm eager to engage with him when the time's right. You know, I know yeah. this isn't the time to be distracting him with stuff like this. And I'm sure he's already has enough of it from the people inside. It's no secret, you know, like who he is within the military, just based off of the uniqueness of his response to the video. <laughs> is that, you think the reason that he hasn't gone public about it is because he's still in there and he just doesn't want to, he doesn't want the attention or? What, it's not even attention. What, what he legally, getting, he's not allowed to Legally, speak he's yeah. not allowed to. Mm -hmm. Do you see any other military people just kind of talking? You? About, yeah. Dude, I, I was almost arrested for that. Really? <laughs> yeah. That's what I've been told. So when I did that, I was, you know, I, I communicated to the best extent I could that I was just communicating as a private citizen about experiences I had. Um, the night before I left to go to DC, I got a call at like 10 PM saying that I now had orders to be there and I need to be there in my, my uniform, my whites essentially. And I need to go to the Pentagon before I went to Congress and the Senate, <laughs> um, which was not a great revelation. But um, so I was scrambling, right? Like I, I was months away from getting out my uniforms packed up and like shipped across the country at this point. It was like my dress white, you know, I wasn't expecting to wear in case there was someone died or something really. Right. Um, so I'm like going around my buddies' houses at like midnight, borrowing their uniforms and their, their stuff so I could, you know, show up because my flight was at like six in the morning next day, you know, like, oh my gosh. um, so it was a bit of a scramble. Um, I ended up going to the Pentagon, mm -hmm. uh, into the bowels. Um, with some naval intelligence folks, um, some who we might be um, more familiar with nowadays since the public hearings. Um, who? I, oh. I, I'm so bad with names. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but um, but we had a conversation about you know my our experiences. Uh, there was nothing nefarious necessarily. It was more of I think wanting to hear from the horse's mouth before him. Uh, I got quite the entourage from there over to uh, to the Senate. Um, there were representatives from the, you know, numerous admirals from the Navy and the Pentagon that accompanied me uh, to the to that meeting, which included representatives from the executive branch, Pentagon, Senate, elsewhere. Um, and essentially, me at a table like this with you know Pentagon folks on one side and um, senators and whatnot and their staffers over here, and me at the head of the table. How old are you at this point? <laughs> um, God, that's a good question. How old am I now? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, I was probably 27, 28. Wow. Yeah, maybe a little bit older. And what 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 was that like? What was the conversation like? Um, what did they seem what did they seem interested in? Like what 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 did you sense the priority was, of what was there with them? <clears throat> they seemed to just want to objective. understand what they were seeing. So from the Pentagon side it seemed like there this you know they had some understanding that there was a problem in this regard, but um, it was classified. Um, we weren't really able to have too much of open conversation about it in that environment. Mm -hmm. um, I would say things, senators would ask me questions and they asked the DOD folks, what do you have to, you know, do you have any comment on that? And the answer was either yes, no, or we'll talk about it, in a, you know, under a higher classification essentially. Mm -hmm. And so they were, they didn't have a lot to add to that conversation on the on the Pentagon side, but it was clear that the um the folks on the senate side were 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 intrigued and were interested and um were they would seem to be asking the right questions of course at the time i didn't know where it was going to go um i i you know said my piece and then just headed back essentially 
Um, it was maybe, you know, an hour, maybe conversation, I think. What was, what were you afraid was going to, were you afraid that oh, yeah. something was going to happen? They were going to, you're going to get fired or something? Uh, yeah, that or Leavenworth, I suppose. But uh, you can't really get fired from the military per se. I mean, you can a little bit, but um, I don't think that was the the, the fear. But um, anyways, I, I they, was... What do they say? Like, like <clears throat> So I was kind of, I was like ignorant of all this kind of drama going on in the background. Right. Um, after, later that night, I got a call from someone who was in the, um, in the, in the meeting that we had on the Hill. Okay. Inquiring whether the, um, the Pentagon had intimidated me or whether they had asked, you know, tried to influence my store or anything of that nature. So there seemed to be, you know, somewhat of a distrust between those two. Wow. That's, that's very interesting. And what I communicated was that that was not the case. I did not perceive that. Well, right. yeah, maybe a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I imagine that's got to be an intimidating situation for a 27-year-old to be called up there the next day and sitting down in front of all these people. Well, I don't Especially know. discussing things. I mean, the, the, it was classified stuff, right? So, so It you, was not. It was not classified. It was not classified because it wasn't, it wasn't happening, right? Like, this mm -hmm. wasn't a thing. And what gave you, what, what made you think that you were almost going to be arrested? Um, <clears throat> what indication did you have of that? <clears throat> Did they make that clear? The person that ended up being responsible for giving me the orders came up to me and told me they did that so I would not be arrested. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's how I know that. Wow, man. Yeah. Well, that explains why no one else is speaking out about it then. <laughs> um, again, I wouldn't expect, yeah, I would not expect military members to publicly speak to the press about this. Mm. Um, that is, I would suggest, out of bounds, um, mm. especially now that there is action going on, right? There is a proper way to alleviate this through the system. I didn't have that luxury at the time. Not only did I not have the luxury, people didn't even think this was a real thing. And so I made a decision I made so that we could prevent someone from getting into a mishap preemptively instead of it happening and then us writing our PCL in blood again. Mm. When was the first time you ever spoke to Commander Fravor about this stuff? I spoke to Commander Fravor the first time I um, interviewed with uh, the History Channel for oh, the show okay. Unidentified. Well, not the first time, the only time I did. Um, they introduced me to Dave Pryor and then he was there as well. Um, I think they were kind of using it as a kind of a comfort thing for me to show that there was someone else. And I actually had recognized Dave because he had, um, I hadn't known him personally at all, but he was in a, a show called Carrier, which is kind of like a documentary of uh, Squadron. And he was the commanding officer of the squadron at the time, Dave was. So I, was, I had seen him actually before I was even a pilot on that show. So oh, it was, really? It was funny to, you know, have him pop. And we're friends now. Mm -hmm. um, we talk a lot now. But um, yeah, that was the first time I met him. I know the objects were, were very different and uh, the stories are very different, but were there, what was the biggest thing that stuck out to you talking to him? I don't know if it's the biggest thing, but the thing that kind of seemed similar was just kind of how, how, what the reaction was, right? Mm. How it was just completely laughed off and ignored and trivialized. Um, which always pissed me off. Uh, not because, I mean, I, you know, we all joke and it's fun. That, that's all good. But, you know, this is directly something that we train for and have a lot of respect for, which is um, not only aviation safety hazards in the sky, but tactical threats as well. Um, we're very well aware that other nations are spying on us. You know, at various times we're flying out there. Um, and this could very easily be an extension in some cases, or it could be leveraged to be uh, a vulnerability for us if um, if a foreign nation wanted to do so. Mm. Uh, and so, for from my perspective, um, I just wasn't I did, I don't approve of the mocking in that from that angle because this is exactly what we're trained to do. Mm. A friend of mine, James Fox, he produced the the, uh, the movie The Phenomenon. I'm I'm sure you're familiar with it. I don't know if you are or not, but uh, he was worked close with Doctor or Jacques Vallée who was one of the, I don't know how close you pay attention. I don't know if, how close you pay attention to like the history of UFO sightings and the whole, and the, and the different documentaries that have come out about it. I know Commander Fravor doesn't. I know he's not, mm -hmm. you know, very interested in UFOs in general. But um, James is a, a big name in like the UFO community as, as far as investigating the different events that have happened throughout history of the United States and around the world. But um, when he was making that movie, The Phenomenon, he told me, um, before he went to interview Commander Fravor for the first time, he was working close with Dr. Jacques Vallée and he asked him if he had any sort of 
you know, can you give me any sort of guidance to how I can approach this guy? Um, and Jacques Vallée, his question was, I'm very interested in the possibility if of them seeing it, if they ever saw it with the naked eye or not, or if this was only on radar, because his main concern was um, holograms in the sky. So, and when he brought this up to Commander Fravor, he was actually kind of like, he almost stopped the interview because of it. He's like, how, how, you think I'm an idiot? You think, you think <laughs> I don't know what DARPA is? You think I know what holograms are? You don't think I knew what I saw? He said, he was very like, not happy about that question. But a lot of people speculate, on, especially on, depending on where you look, online or, or wherever, that a lot of these things could potentially be some sort of secret military technology that is used to confuse enemy radar, like with different holograms or whatever it may be. I don't know which part of the military would be responsible for this. I don't know if it would be the Navy or the Air Force or, or whatever. But um, are you familiar with this idea? Yeah. What, what are your thoughts on it? Um, I, in particular, I, I even had a guy on here that was a Harvard professor that was contracted by DARPA. He was the one who brought this up to me in the first place. Mm -hmm. And he claimed, he said to me that these sort of holograms that are designed to distract enemy radar are a real thing. Yeah. Something I've never heard of before. Yeah, let me just kind of provide some background on like what DARPA actually does. I've worked with DARPA. Um, you'd probably be mad at me, but Dave's worked with DARPA, you know, you know, he works um, generally, well, I don't want to say anything more, but DARPA is a very low technology readiness level organization. What that means is they work on things that are very low TRL, call that TRL zero, um, where the other end of the spectrum would be TRL or technology readiness level nine. And nine means that it's a capability that is uh, deployable for testing essentially with operators, right? Nine. And so okay. DARPA usually works around the zero to maybe like doing a little bit more, but like three or four TRL. So what that means is the technology is not really proven. If it's a zero, it might be math equations. Right? Okay. Um, and so when people talk about DARPA doing things, DARPA's MO isn't to build an operational technology and then test it for years, right? That's not what they do. That would be an operate. That would be post TRL nine, right? That would be another organization be the Navy, okay, right? Because they, they would be the ones or perhaps another organization, and I, I don't think there's a relevant like NSA or CIA, like they could potentially leverage that technology and take it in. So if we're talking about Nemesis, which is um, what I understand to be kind of generally speaking, kind of the holographic um, EW confusion type technology, it would be the Navy testing it in our most active training ranges off the East Coast. That's what that would mean. It would mean that they were doing it for uh, the better part of a decade and still doing it. Uh, it would also mean that they're doing it over international waters, which means any country can go out there and study it. Mm. Um, and it would also mean that we're um, not testing these things at our billion dollar ranges that we have out in the Western US that are designed specifically for this type of activity, such as, you know, uh, Navy China Lake or any of these other testing facilities that we have. Right? Navy China Lake? Yeah, it's a weapons oh. testing um, place that a lot of test pilots go to in the Navy or other places. Right? It's where we develop weapons, essentially, okay. and test them out. We get a new bomb, send it to China Lake, strap on F-18 of the test pilot, and see what happens when you drop it, right? Like it's an mm. operational test area. Okay. Right? So we have places <laughs> to test this type of stuff. So when people talk about you know, these programs um, like that, that's all well and good. There's a lot of interesting technology that could be pieced together to provide examples of how something could be feasible. But if you step away from that and look about the at the application and the implementation of that technology, it starts to not make as much sense, right? Why would we be testing this for seven, eight, nine years after it's been public in international waters off the coast, especially when there's safety reports? Now, um, Why would we be testing it for eight to 10 years in international waters? Like you're saying that we wouldn't typically do it for that long? No. We don't, I mean, that's a whole cycle of development. You know what I mean? Like 10 years is a long time to be testing a particular piece yeah, of technology exactly. in a public yet hidden manner. You know what I mean? Right. 
So I mean, this isn't this doesn't like directly refute what you're saying. I understand mm -hmm. that, but I'm just kind of providing some context around okay. kind of these systems and why. I think uh, I think what you said about DARPA is very. I think what you said about DARPA is very interesting, and a lot of people could could gain some context from that. So so you said you guys you worked with DARPA. Why would a Navy pilot work with DARPA? And and what exactly is DARPA? Navy for pilot. People who don't know. Yeah. So a Navy pilot did it, but when I was working at BA Systems as a technology development manager, that was my job was essentially okay. to source or create or ideate on technology that would be relevant to the warfighter uh, in 10 to 15 years that um, I could essentially pitch to DARPA and we build it. Um, and so primarily what I was doing when I was at BA System was automating my job as a fighter pilot. Uh, I was working on multi-agent intelligences, right? So autonomous wingman, um, forward edge tactical systems such as uh, tactics on weapons or aircraft related to autonomous systems, mm -hmm. um, the reality of what hypersonic weapons and tactics look like. So this is all areas I was working in. Wow. And so, and what specifically does DARPA do? Yeah. What does it, what does it stand for? DARPA is a Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Defense Advanced Research Projects mm -hmm. Agency. Okay. So their charge is to um, work on technologies um, that are highly risky, uh, that could fail. Uh, they expect a lot of their projects to fail. In mm. fact, they call it DARPA hard projects. Like if you bring a project that's not hard enough, they'll just tell you no. Right? They would prefer to see something <laughs> that has a lower probability of success but a greater reward if it's successful. Okay. Right? And so that's kind of the regime that they work in. And they work close with these quote unquote think tanks, correct? Is that? Um, I don't know if that's okay. the case or not. I mean, what is a think tank? I don't know. I mean, right. I, I'm sure a think tank. Sounds cool. Yeah. I mean, a think tank could potentially just be a group of smart people that bid on a contract for that DARPA was put out and they have the specialty to win that contract. Mm. But DARPA typically works with um, big defense corporations, but also with the startup community in some sense. Mm. Uh, the intelligence community essentially has its own version of DARPA that is specific for intelligence type operations right. where DARPA is more military. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's what they do. So are you aware of anything? Is there any sort of technology that's utilized with the military to confuse enemy radar like this though? Like is there even- There's tons of it. There's okay. not, not like this per se, but there's a ton of them, right? That falls under general category of electronic warfare. Okay. Or even cyber warfare, you could consider it that. But that's, I mean, another branch essentially that's being stood up at this point. Cyber command, having an understanding. The F-35 that I told you about mm -hmm. is very much an electronic warfare aircraft. Um, it soaks everything up. It can um, jam. It can do all sorts of stuff. Um, when we start talking about, um, and it's not just us, um, you know, everyone wants to see how we can fool the next um the first wave essentially, right? If we have a World War III with anyone or whatever, um, there's gonna be a lot of jamming, missiles are gonna be falling out of the sky and things of that nature. Um, and one way to do that is with uh, fooling radars to make them think that there's something there when there's not. Um, I don't know why you would then take that and apply that to IR. I guess there are some reasons. IR sensors are getting better for combat, I'll say. There's something called the Erst. Um, IRST, and that is essentially a IR targeting pod. Uh, the Russians have been using them for a while, but we didn't quite use them that much because our radars were better. They were essentially compensating for a lack of radar technology by mm -hmm. having them. But we're getting Earths now as well. And so um, really what that is, is uh, a different way of, of being able to target into these things um, at range. Because um, if you think of the way Fravor talked about the tic tac moving it seemed like he was basically describing a laser pointer right that's the way those things moved if you pointed at a wall it was moving as if it didn't have mass i think right. would be a way of describing it uh light does not really have mass so um mm. a shadow or something that was non-massive could move as if it didn't have mass if it wasn't physically real so it it was nuts and bolts but it was also psychic if you will, like like knew where he was going to be, right? Yeah, I mean, the object showed up at the cat point. Um, is that is that quote that wouldn't be psychic? I know, sort of the way these things are moving doesn't necessarily jive with general relativity, right? Like these things could be using some sort of some sort of propulsion that is gravity 
like anti-gravity or it, it's not necessarily like a jet. It's not shooting something out the back to move. It's somehow manipulating gravity to move like that. I'll agree that we don't see them spitting stuff out the back, but <laughs> the mechanism that they are using, although gravity and space time metric engineering is a potential option for that, there I think are others as well. Really? Um, yeah. So, you know, there's, um, well, let me just say this. Um, <clears throat> Transportation really at the end of the day comes down to energy, right? right? If we, ha if you can put enough energy into a, one piece, we have the math to build a, you know, a warp drive or what have you, engineer space time metric, uh, warp space time, which therefore would be warp and gravity and allow you to potentially move super liminally. That's, you know, one mm -hmm. fun theory. Um, mass reduction is you know a technology that has been proposed if you were able to reduce the mass of an object then moving it through the air would be much more seamless um reducing air friction is it warping space time around it to avoid the friction or is it somehow moving air particles around it right um we just don't know the answer to these questions yeah. um so one of the things i'm doing is trying to get the answers to those um and the way i'm doing it is through the american institute of aeronautics and astronautics uh, where i chair the uap Integration and Outreach Committee. It's about a 50 person large um, engineering organization uh, under the AIAA or AIAA as I call it, uh, which is a professional engineering organization with 30,000 plus members. Uh, and we've built a team of, of fantastic, you know, industry engineers that are kind of coming out of the woodwork to study this kind of from an industry first viewpoint. And one of the projects that we have underway is to help define what some of the detection mechanisms could be for these objects. And just like you said, is it uh, affecting gravity and how can we detect that? Is it using some type of ionization um, and magnetohydrodynamics to move the air around the vehicle? Um, and if that's the case, how can we detect that? And so we're gonna be promulgating um, a document to the engineering industry on a yearly basis that updates the best sensing phenomenologies and lessons learned and everything we know so that the rest of the industry can start putting technology together to expand our data sets. So there's a lot of uh, private aerospace companies that are working on this, correct? That, that are basically sharing information and trying to work together to put more data together to try to understand this. I don't have information on that. I thought I read that. That was part of uh, AA, what is it, AAIA? Um, our group is made up of... Uh, engineers and scientists from all across the industry, from NASA to various DOD to mm. industry to startups. Mm. Um, and so I wouldn't say necessarily any of those companies they represent. Actually, I would say this. They don't represent the companies at all when they're there. Uh, but there are members of across the industry that are very interested in this. Do you think it's possible that there is private aerospace companies, contractors, that have technology that they're not sharing with the mainstream academia? Technology, yeah, absolutely, 100%. Science, I don't know. Like anti-gravity, do you think it's possible that there's some sort of private aerospace weapons contractor, like whatever, for example, Boeing or Lockheed that has figured out anti-gravity and it's not being shared with the public? Like it, I think it's because, possible. Because it would, it would effectively it would be immune to FOIA requests, right? Because it's a private company. That's a that's a theory I've heard, or maybe it's not even a theory, maybe it's a fact, but generally speaking, yeah, I think that I think that is possible that our private defense industries and contractors have technology that isn't promulgated and is classified. Hmm. But it would be for them to be testing it off the coast of That's not a defense contractor. That is a that would be a government program. It would have to be, right? Yeah. Lockheed wouldn't just be out in those areas. Like that that would have to be again approved military, you know, test, which means But wouldn't the wouldn't I mean, forgive me if this is like an ignorant question. I don't know anything about this stuff. <laughs> so Lockheed wouldn't be able to get permission or work with the military to do this kind of testing. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying okay. that's not the way things work on a regular basis. Right. Um they go to ranges all the time. I've been to ranges as a in a the defense industry, you know, mm -hmm. to work on various technologies, but operational flight training areas and flight operation areas are a totally different beast. You know what I mean? Um, that's, um, you know, different between, um, I don't even know what the different, I don't even know the best way to phrase it, but, um, like I said, like that entry area to our working area is one of the busiest places of the sky on the Eastern seaboard, right? Right. So we're now putting, we're testing objects by putting them directly at the entry point of that area at altitude after hazard reports have been submitted right. for eight years. 
Right. I don't see the logic. I don't see how we could be testing against ourselves, especially when we kind of zoom out and say, okay, where are we now in the world about this topic? Mm. Do we really think that, you know, John Ratcliffe and President, former President Obama are going out on a limb because we're testing some, you know, uh, EW on the East Coast? It, the conversations got too large to support the thesis that we're testing EW. Okay. You know what I mean? In my In my opinion, like... We've gone beyond that just based off of how much conversation has been around this because we're just drawing more attention to this. Right. Sense, you know what I mean? Right. And that's another kind of element you have to throw into this whole thing is if it was something we – why would we be throwing all this attention? Why would the U.S. government intentionally, intentionally kind of like – acknowledge this like this why would the pentagon acknowledge it so much you always have to question their intentions just based on history right mm -hmm. one speaking of history one thing i often think of and I, this isn't necessarily a leading question but um what lessons did we learn from the proliferation of nuclear weapons right we create a nuclear weapon and others are trying to create it and now we live in a world that has nuclear weapons mm. everywhere and it's a fear if we developed a technology that had the power of a nuclear weapon, perhaps even greater, what lessons would we have learned from that proliferation and taken that and applied to this new technology? Yeah. Where would we have blackened out the conversation? The engineering side? At the fundamental science side? I don't know the answer to these questions, but I imagine we learned some lessons from that. Yeah, I don't know, man. I feel like we have we're a species that has amnesia amnesia when it comes to this kind of stuff you know what really kind of like tipped off tipped me off to or or made me start leaning in the direction of it's it could be human technology is that is when the pentagon started really acknowledging it and you know putting out the new york times dropping these articles and the pentagon putting out more and more information about it and sh declassifying these reports but not showing the whole thing. Like that's when I started to sort of go, you know, switch to maybe this isn't some sort of extraterrestrial thing. Maybe this could very plausibly be something a foreign nation has or that we have that we're just not getting the whole truth about it. I bet um, it's probably somewhere in the middle, you know? I would I would think somewhere that, in the middle as in like we took the technology that we found from somewhere off Earth and then we sort of like back engineered it or something. I think that'd be the safer bet to to make that assumption that um, it's very probable if this has been going on for a while that some of what we're seeing is is our own, but gener but originates from you know something else, and not to say alien or, or your other fl you know whatever the flavor of other you like. But mm -hmm. that I think that's a very feasible uh, consideration to think that you know we've been trying to work in engineering this, and some sightings could be contributed to that. I think that's a reasonable statement. What do you think about Bob Lazar's story? How how much credit do you give that? Have you ever talked to him? Oh, no, personally, no. Um, I, I mean, it's interesting. And like I told Joe, I, you know, I want to believe it. It's it's interesting, but I just don't have any evidence other than, you know, the media that's been created to tell his story. And that's just not a sufficient for me to draw a conclusion on my own. Mm. What do you think about the th the way he describes, um, the way he describes the, the anti-gravity propulsion and being able to manipulate time? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, that's, that's, that's something that you, you're, you study, right? That's something that yeah, you're very much Yeah, I mean, that's into. grounded in, in, in good science. Um, anytime that you would create some type of uh, field that warps space time around you, you would be by necessity uh, warping time as well. Um, any increase in gravity or concentration of it in some sense um, is going to um, cause time to slow down the more dense and the, more, the stronger those, the stronger the gravity are. is. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, um, yeah, and so that, you know, um, I don't know if that supports his story necessarily. That's something we've known for a long time, mm -hmm. uh, 20 years or so. Uh, but it is consistent with, uh, I think, special relativity, or excuse me, general relativity. Mm -hmm. Being a pilot and experiencing everything you've experienced and, and just being, like, immersed in this technology, this, this war technology, which is incredible. What do you see as the future of war and technology developing together and and what does that look like? Does it look like some of these objects? You think eventually in the future, this is just like there's no more pilots in fighter jets? What do you think it looks like? Yeah, I, I think that's where we're going. Um, I think the direction we're going is, you know, you could call it like a objective-based autonomy in a sense. So um, 
a wing or a, a mission commander who might be an F-35 or eventually maybe back on the boat or elsewhere um, will likely assign um, uh, mission objectives that need to be accomplished to a swarm of assets that the pilot doesn't necessarily know what they are, right? He doesn't know where they are. He doesn't know what weapons they carry. He doesn't even know what mm -hmm. they look like potentially. <clears throat> I'm moving around. You're good. Um, but he, 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 um, verifies the target and validates it and, you know, issues the commands. And then the target is prosecuted with those assets that the autonomy is suggested. Um, we're going to use this and this and this to create those effects first, taking one jet with a bunch of different weapons and saying, okay, try to make those effects work with what you have. And there's more of almost like a cloud concept of warfare and the mission commander is making those decisions. Mm. And so I see autonomy um, playing a massive role in that. And what that's going to lead to is um, more congested battle space, right? Which is um, kind of what all this kind of talk about EW is all about, right? It's about congesting the battle space and making it more difficult to target and making it so the pilots don't know if the radar contact they just shot at is a real aircraft or not, or if they just wasted a missile, right? You can, wasting missiles is great. You only have so many of them. So you can have the enemy shoot at drones or at, um, false tracks on the radar, then you're going to win that fight eventually. What this could lead to is a reemergence of uh, dogfighting as a valuable skill, right? So our fights actually take place over such long distances. If it is a true, you know, uh, war type scenario where missions need to be accomplished, uh, eventually you're going to have to go in and increase your risk if all your long range weapons are gone, right? Or if they've been trashed through EW. Mm. So what that means is getting closer and using your guns and IR missiles in a dogfight. Oh, wow. And so there is a potential, should things get bad, to actually kind of reinvigorate the dogfighting regime if um, there'll likely be a transitioning period where there are still pilots, um, where if if that has passed, then it'll just be all, you know, autonomous stuff fighting each other. Uh, right. But before that, you could have a chance where the EW is so good that everyone's trying to employ their weapons, they get trashed, so you have to go and close. Mm. Um, so if that's the case, um, well, I'm going to go into that, but. So, you know, what does it look like? It, it looks like congestion, right? It looks like um, it looks like a fog of war. It's more confusing. There's more uncertainty. There's more wasted assets. There's more uh, ability to be clever and tricky, perhaps. There's a weird thing that happens. I've had a guy, I had a guy on here who was a drone pilot. He, he was working at a base in Las Vegas and he was operating drones and pulling the trigger and, mm -hmm. and killing people on the ground. Um, I forget in what country, but there's a, there's a thing that happens. There's a disconnect between people who are doing that across the world, operating some drone, like a video game. And then someone who's actually flying a plane mm -hmm. and like being there in person. And, you know, I just wonder like the psychology of if, if that's what war comes to people being across the world just like hitting buttons on a controller versus being there in real life like what are the impl what are the long term implications of that and how does that how does that affect I think the, the long term implications is that it could probably get to a new um um deterrent sy system similar to nuclear weapons in a sense right um if you have if you have uh, confidence in your ability to be successful without risking lives or making it politically tricky, then it might be more likely in order to engage in those type of skirmishes. That would be the fear in a sense. It's like life becomes more disposable almost. Yeah. In a sense though, the technology, and I've argued for this, um, in fact, you know, when I was at, um, at BA Systems, we had some interns come in and, um, you know, one of them actually, you know, took the opportunity to ask, you know, how do you justify this type of work, you know, creating weapons and things of that nature at this point. Uh, and as someone has, you know, been out there employing these weapons, it was, it was easy for me to answer because accuracy enables safer warfare if you have a moral government in a sense, right? If your government doesn't want to kill civilians, being more precise is better. And that's why I said, as long as we assume we have moral leadership, then we would want our weapons to be as essentially powerful and as accurate as possible mm. as a mitigate, mitigating force. Um, and so yeah. I think that's where we go. Things will continue to get more accurate and more precise, which may have negative consequences because people may feel more justified using them. 
So I think you're the perfect person person to ask this question. What is hypersonic? I hear about it all the time. I hear about missiles being hypersonic, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to this war in Ukraine and Russia and Russia having these hypersonic missiles. What is that? What does that mean? Yeah. Is it the same thing as like Mach levels, like Mach 1 through 10? Yep. Okay. Mach, um, anything below Mach 5 is just supersonic, they call it. Above Mach 5 is hypersonic. Okay. And so hypersonic, uh, I forget what the barrier is, but there's also a thermal barrier that you need to get through um, to go certain speeds. You can't just continuously go faster with a more powerful engine because you're going to just start to melt stuff, right? And so there's kind of a thermal barrier that's related to our material science and engineering levels. But generally, it is what it sounds like. Things are just going a lot faster. Just faster. And what does that mean? You know, everything in war really, it's, um, it's war is not that complicated at the end of the day. You know, you just need to do the simple thing better than the other person in a way. And when we have these ICBMs and cruise missiles and all these things like that, the most important consideration is how long can I intercept that missile for? When is it visible to me? It's visible when it's on my radar. And so if there's curvature of the earth, depending on where the missile is launched, we put radar sites in various places so we can see the missile sooner, right? Uh, we put them in space so we can see them as soon as they launch, perhaps, right? Uh, hypersonic missiles uh, reduce the time that you can see the missiles because they're traveling so fast that they can go um, at altitudes that uh, prevent radars from seeing them due to the curvature of the earth in some cases. And then it also decreases the time to intercept that missile. And so, for example, if Russia had a hypersonic missile uh, that could just travel over to the U.S., um, that could pose a significant issue because our systems might not be calibrated to be able to hit hypersonic missiles, maybe only supersonic missiles, right? So it's just a stair step, just like everything in war, it seems. Right. Something's fast, you find out a way to take it out, let's speed it up so those other systems don't work anymore. Are there any sort of missiles that can just change direction on a dime? Well, um, no, no, no. There's um, some interesting stuff you could do if you had like a throttled missile, uh, but that's not what you're describing. Mm. Instantaneous movements or anything like that. Even if we had a missile. So the way these missiles work is that you lock up, you shoot, and they'll go near the object. And once they get within a certain range, they'll save some energy so they can perform what they call like a max G maneuver at the very end in order to trade all their energy to get close enough to impact the aircraft with shrapnel. Uh, and so when they do that, they might pull like 70 or 80 Gs, um, which is a lot, but compared to an ejection where the first few milliseconds is like 300 Gs. Um, 300 Gs? Yeah, for like a millisecond. The only reason you can, and then it backs off to like 12 Gs, but it, it just kicks off very fast. The only reason that's survivable is just due to the inertia of your body and the blood. Um, wow. And yeah, so 300, boom, and then it slows down. Um, yeah, sorry, I forgot where we were going with that though. Yeah, we were just talking about how, like the, the way the missiles oh, travel yeah. and how fast they travel, and then you got into ejecting at 300 Gs. Yeah, but when you start talking about um, something like with David Fravor and moving position very fast, and the Gs in there could be in the thousands. That's the first thing I just thought about mm -hmm. is if there was, if there was, Actual, if there were actual like like beings inside of those things, they would just be liquefied. Potentially, if they um, if they had mass and and if they were operating with our normal space time frame, right? So, if you're bending space time, then you're right. going to be in your own isolated bucket, and you're not going to be feeling uh, those inertia changes, right? Because gravity mm. is a field, right? And so, gravity is affecting the atoms of your body all at the same time. It doesn't pull on your head and then pull on here. It's a field that's pulling all in the same direction. So if you're moving gravity, you're not going to be feeling that inertia changes. Mm -hmm. um, that's one way you could do that. Another way is to reduce somehow the uh, mass of the object and so that it doesn't have as much of effect from inertia. Right. And right. I'm, I don't have all the answers here. I'm just kind of just explaining a couple uh, potential options where you could see that minim you could see the um, you could see that movement and still survive. Mm. Uh, if we don't assume any of that and assume they're operating in a normal environment without reducing mass or affecting um, space time, then yeah, the G-forces would be probably, well, not probably, they would be too much even for hardware. Has anybody ever seen one of these things manipulate the environment? Like for example, punch through clouds or, or, or affect the water at all or anything like that? Well, they for Dave Fravor talked about kind of the water being spun up underneath the Tic Tac. Um, but I, I'm not aware of really, no, I'm not really aware of any cases like you described. 
What? Yeah. What did he say about how the, the thing was like hovering right above the water and there was just sort of like white water below him? Or yeah, well, I think they kind of described it as like foaming or or bubbly in a sense. Because mm. that's another huge element of this is being underwater. They think being, how, how much attention do you guys pay to being a navy pilot? How much attention do you guys pay to like things happening on the surface of the water? Or ever? Do you ever? Do yeah, that? no, we do. We have okay. particular radar modes for ships. Um, Are submarines a threat? Not to me. Not to, <laughs> not to aircrafts. Um, okay. Uh, not that I'm aware of. Okay. But um, they're certainly well. If we're on an aircraft carrier, they are. If the, if, the, if the submarine comes to the surface, though, could they be a threat? Um, I honestly don't know enough about submarine weapon systems okay. to tell you. <laughs> I, I hope not. <laughs> um, but no, I, no, typically we're not worried about submarines. But you know, we don't really have the capability to track objects in a trans transmedia manner. So mm -hmm. if we see something get close to the ocean, um, we may have trouble tracking it depending on how close it gets, just due to the movement of water and all that stuff. Uh, and then if it goes below, it's just going to disappear off our radar. There's no continuation. Um, so we can't necessarily make that assessment of it mm -hmm. going in the water. We just see it and then we see it. And our radar is so, it can see very far away. So right. all, almost 99.9% .9 of the time, what we're seeing on the radar is well beyond our visual range. What is sort of happening currently within the government, publicly or not, that you're aware of, to sort of like move this whole conversation forward and push it more into get it away from the stigmatization that people are used to? Yeah, you know, and we were seeing a lot of good work on that um, within the AIAA. I mean, that's one of our our primary missions is to to, to mitigate. Um, the stigma around this topic so that we can do real science on the topic. And we are, we're seeing that form up now. We're seeing, you know, the engineering uh, skill sets and prowess come in that want to approach this scientifically and agnostically. Uh, within the government itself, we have uh, the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, or as I call it, ARO. It's a mouthful. Yeah. <laughs> Not as bad as, yeah, 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 double A, but, um, <laughs> but, um, there seems to be a, a a very concerted effort to actually get to the bottom of this, in my in my view. Uh, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick of Arrow, um, I've heard him express that he believes he has all all the access that he needs in order to continue investigating this. Um, I know that he's you know made trips to national archives and he's really you know putting the legwork into understanding this. So I believe that he is truly uh, working to uncover this uh, to the best of his ability. And it, from my perspective, he's getting the support he needs from the Senate and Congress in order to do that. Um, with the National Defense Authorization Act um, that was signed by uh, President Biden recently. What had, is that one? What is that act? Uh, Na uh, National Defense Authorization Act. Okay. Uh, had somewhere around 30 pages of uh, UAP-related uh, legislation in there. Uh, that uh, essentially forces a reckoning of uh, any classified programs or manipulation attempts on the public related to this topic going back all the way to 1945. Additionally, it um, removes whistleblower limitations uh, for potential whistleblowers from $300,000 for um, um, liability to unlimited. Uh, and that I heard about that. both for defense contractors as well as uh, military, uh, military folks as well. And so really what we see is this is a mechanism for kind of opening it up and allowing Congress and Senate to um, really run this to ground. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, the NDA also um, has arrow reporting, I believe to the SECDEF or Deputy SECDEF now versus ODNI. Uh, and so the last report that came out uh, was an ODNI based report. Um, I would think going forward, there might be... Um, a little more ease in communication now that there's been a transfer. What, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, what is his background and what is his... Uh... He's a former chief scientist at the, I think, the uh, Missile Defense Agency, uh, U.S. So he's been, uh, he's he's a well-established and published uh, scientist that has been working for uh, the DOD in various capacities for quite some time. Okay. How much attention do you pay to some of the other stories that are coming out? I mean, obviously... You, your background is, is very objective, is very science-based, very tactical. But when it comes to like some of these other stories and some of these other things that are coming out, like for example, like James Fox's new latest documentaries, how much attention do you pay to that kind of stuff? Um, 
or even like abduction stories? Is that just too out there for you or do you pay attention to it? Uh, I, I'm doing my homework to some degree. It's just, oh, there's a lot out there. Um, I, um, you talk about the, the, is it Viag how do you pronounce it? Virginia? Virginia. Is that the one? Yeah. Did yeah. you hear about that? Uh, yeah, I watched that. It was, it was fascinating. I mean, it's interesting, but generally speaking, it's not the way I kind of, so there's, there's two ways I kind of approach this topic. There's one is in a sense, it's almost due diligence where, uh, I am engaging in those, um, those types of, um, stories to some small degree. I mean, not small degree, but you know, just through the literature, I'm not actively investigating or like talking to, um, the problem is it's so entertaining, right? Yeah. It's, well, there's been a, a trend, I think, in the past where due to lack of data, probably for one reason, that there has been an entertainment industry of sorts that has kind of folded on around this. Um, I don't see myself as necessarily participating in that. And so, yeah, go back a second. You know, I try to do my homework to get a broad understanding of this, but I'm very focused on the future as well. Um, I think that there are real solutions that we can bring forward in order to better understand this outside of the military leash, right? I don't think the way to um, expand this conversation is to uh, just wait for the government to essentially provide us with the answers. Um, yeah. We know we know, we can see these things, right? We can see them on certain radars. These radars aren't, they're classified, but the technology necessarily isn't. You can find phase arrays radars out there. Um, and. The democratization and access to these technologies, I think, are going to allow us to expand this conversation with or without the government. And I think that maybe is why this time is so unique. Um, the tools that you have access to can provide answers that the government can't necessarily keep a leash on. Yeah, man. But like the Virginia case is so interesting, too, because a lot of the people that were there that day, James says that they were just intimidated to the point where they would not talk about it. Like the one guy, he literally chased him off, threatened to shoot him and kill him if he didn't leave his property <laughs> because the government intimidation. They, mm -hmm. they say that these people, these quote unquote men in black would come and basically tell them like, if you love your family, don't say a word about this to anyone. Mm -hmm. And then additionally, additionally to that, this so-and-so, this so-called being that was found, the Air Force, the United States Air Force, all these United States planes landed the next day and basically like hushed everyone up and took all the evidence and went back to the United States. So like, <laughs> it's almost like the biggest barrier is at the same time the government, even though the government is claiming to put all these things out in the New York Times. The Pentagon wants to openly talk about it. It's like, this is what we're doing on the public side, but on the other side, we're also doing all this stuff with intimidation and all this stuff to keep people to, sh well, know, keep uh, people to shut up. Yeah, I don't disagree, but I think one of the, the misconceptions is that um, the government is extremely well run. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. One, I, you know, I think there are different factions. I think there's different people within the government that are involved in this. And I don't necessarily think that they all work together. Uh, mm -hmm. The government is so big and there's so many people and personalities and interests. Um, it's not as monolithic as, as, as people make it out to seem. And this story you just described, um, I, you know, it's interesting because, you know, what, what official channel of communication exists between Brazil and the United States in order to facilitate something like that? Um, you know, that must be, must be an ongoing relationship of some degree well, or Brazi to form then. Brazil, from what I understand, really relies on the United States and they rely on having a good, really strong relationship with the United States. I could be wrong, but... On UAP? On anything, if they had something and... So if you're Brazil, why would you want to keep that from the U.S.? Was the U.S. even studying, right? Like officially the government wasn't really studying this. So was there some communication between them? If there was some high level commander or high like the like uh, the head of the military in brazil do you think they have an open line of communication to somebody here no, no? that would have to go through political channels mm. so i you know i don't have any answer here but uh like these are these are the things that interest me the case is very interesting but what does that relationship tell us when did it start did it start then or did it start elsewhere and if it started elsewhere why did it start there Mm -hmm. What else don't we know? You know, and so um, I, I don't, the, the case is fascinating. I want to know more. I want it to be true. But th these are the clues I try to look for to help better understand, you know, really what's going on, you know? And it's so much different than what you're seeing too, because there's, there, if that case was true, there was a, a biological being inside of a craft 
that accidentally crashed. If these things are so advanced, how the hell would it accidentally crash? And why would they why would they travel so far and put a a a, a biological being that is of importance to whatever civilization it came from? Why would they leave it? Why would it be strange? You know, it seems like they're so advanced that that sort of thing wouldn't happen. I think there's some assumptions in there that I'll push back on. Okay. One, um, <clears throat> a Lamborghini is incredibly advanced, you know, or, or, you know, anything, a Tesla, mm -hmm. they still break. Now, even if you take that to the extreme scale, is there, you know, 100% success rate? I don't know. That's just a, one poor argument against the, the crashing, right? Um, if you were to take one back to 3000 BC and drop someone in a car, they probably think it worked all the time too, but let's just right. let's just put that's, that aside. That's, you're right, that's fair. Um, let's just let's put it a, put it aside for the most part, um, and then talk about the assumption around a biological entity having importance. Mm -hmm. um, I would imagine that technology would move into an area where you'd be able to replicate biology artificially, mm -hmm. and that would be probably a much more efficient means of of reproduction of the asset or. Uh, the modification of it and the, the maintenance of it versus, say, a heavy uh, mechanical object. I, that's just an asset. I'm not saying that's truth or like, anything, but I'm just saying. We would be able to print, like 3D print our bodies, so right? Just because something's biological doesn't mean that it's uh, evolved over billions of years to be a self-intelligent, self, you know, in, in its own agent, agent, right? Intelligent agent. Um, it's biological, but does that mean it's not a robot in some sense? Right. I don't know. That's an assumption, I think. So just because it's biological, maybe that's just, you know, the best means for doing the thing. Right. Yeah. No, no, no. That that does make sense. And then, you know, that kind of like goes to the idea that once we do advance to a certain level that, we, you know, we the like our bottleneck right now is our biological bodies decay and we age and we die. But if in a thousand years, it seems plausible that we would be able to, I mean, we're already doing it. We're, we're already... We're already cloning ourselves, cloning cells, and and basically like three D printing skin. Mm -hmm. Like burn victims can get brand new skin. So why wouldn't we be able to eventually just create new meat vehicles that we're in right now and just and just basically take our consciousness and put it into a new one? So yeah. essentially, that if this was in a civilization that was that advanced, they would be able to do something similar to that. Maybe there is no consciousness too. Another assumption. You, know, you have a potentially have a biological being that isn't necessarily a conscious agent, perhaps. Mm. Um, you know, I'm going to at least get rid of the, the the consciousness transfer that you mentioned. In. Right. Um, we can we can throw away that assumption. But these, you know, these, these are the fun conversations. We're never going to like get to a conclusion on any of this. Right. But it's it's interesting because I I try hard to not anthropomorphize this conversation too much. And it's so easy, right? We assume it's a biological entity on there and so that has value to the society in some sense. Maybe that's right, not the case, right? right? Exactly. Um, that's what makes this makes this conversation so difficult. Right. The thing though, that it is, it is a very different situation what happened there with the thing crashing with something in it than what you, it seems like compared to what you guys were seeing. I agree with that. Um, you know, and then if you were to attribute something like a technology that we have, like a, some sort of advanced military technology, then how, how do you explain all the things that were happening in the 40s? All the different, you know, sightings and, you know, there's there's documented cases of all these things hovering above nuclear bases in like the, in like the you know, the early days. I don't know what year, what decade that was, 50s, 60s, 70s. You know, how plausible is it that we had that technology back then? You know, what the hell was going on back then? Yeah, I don't have an answer to that question. You know, but that that is kind of the weird thing about this subject is it's so entertaining, it's so fun to talk about, but at the <laughs> same time, that's at the same time what makes it kind of like what makes people be able to d dismiss it so easily. Mm -hmm. You know, because you have the History Channel, but the History Channel just makes stuff entertainment. It's really yeah. entertainment. I don't know if you've ever watched a show on the History Channel, like some of these shows like Skinwalker Ranch, like – a person like me who's familiar with like production and how it works and watching this thing happen it's just they're making a fucking movie and they're trying to entertain people like yeah. for somebody who understands some of the stuff that that has actually happened in these situations and and the research that's been done behind it scientifically and then you watch it dramatized on television to to me 
kind of like doesn't do it any favors. Yeah. It makes it less credible to me. But I understand like it's fucking entertaining and people want to see it and you can make money. Companies like the History Channel and the Discovery Channel, they make tons of money because it's inter- it is entertaining. And now now with the conversations that are happening with, you know, and with the New York Times and the Pentagon, now it's actually getting more and more truth. So this stuff is becoming more and more of a financial opportunity for entertainment. Nietzsche, niche, niche. What's that word? Niche, niche. niche. Um, yeah, I mean, generally speaking, I think more attention that goes on this, the more people, um, for good reasons and bad reasons, will try to financially gain from it. Um, I, I do have one pushback, which is, you know, one thing I've seen a lot is that there seems to be this almost gatekeeping around the topic, where if you're not doing it for the pure enjoyment of the topic, uh, then you're doing it for the wrong reasons, and I, I don't agree with that. Um, this has been relegated to a hobby for way too long. And a hobby is not a sustainable way of creating a new industry around something that we, mm. we're seeing out there that requires mm-hmm. technology and investment and research and people to to commit to that research and write papers, right? And guess how that gets done? Money. money. Yes. So, hey, eventually we got to grow up and start putting our money where our mouth is. Yes. And that doesn't mean necessarily entertainment, but hey, the government, you know, they're not going to buy censors for the general public to figure this out. Uh, will NASA? I doubt it. I've had conversations, you know, with members from from NASA and people from Arrow, and you know, they both are pretty aligned around the fact that the normal funding channels for this type of work it doesn't really exist uh, within DoD, um, and they don't really exist within NASA. And we're seeing a little bit of a change. We're seeing, you know, NASA put a little bit of money, hundred thousand, as they, you know, essentially build a program. They put a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah. So you know, but it, the point is that they're not they're not doing work with that. They're building a recommendation for a program, mm-hmm. right? And that's the output. Um, they're going to be looking at the data and uh, various things and providing a recommendation on how NASA can uh, actually gather data to bring answers forward on this. And so that's when I think more money will come in and stuff. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, to go back to your point on entertainment and stuff, I think that's why a lot of pilots haven't been willing to talk about this because it has been more in that UFO attainment type of mindset. UFO attainment, good word. And they don't want to, pilots don't want to risk their careers by going on something like that and getting labeled Mm -hmm. uh, as, you know, a believer or something like that, right? It's, I think, a little derogatory to kind of label these pilots that have witnessed things believers in a sense, because a lot of these people have seen some very inexplicable things with their own eyeballs with multiple aircraft and multiple air crew like mm-hmm. their first officer and multiple other um, um, professional aviators. And they're seeing things that have changed their lives. Right. You know, that have, they've gone out and talked to artists to do um, drawings of what they've seen and they've kept in touch with the pilots they've seen this with. And so to take those emotional experiences in some cases and take it onto a UFO type attainment uh, thing, it's just, no, they're not gonna go anywhere near it. Mm-hmm. Um, they, will, they will potentially lose their job um, and the way it works in the airlines, you can be at a company for 40 years. And if you leave that company and you go to another airline, you go right to the bottom of the pile with 20 year olds, you know, that will be more senior to you. It's very, it's all seniority based. So wow. if you've been in and you have a long career and you want to start talking about something like this, that's quite the risk to take. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that's why I've created the podcast Merge because I want to provide a scientifically focused, neutral place for aviators, scientists, and innovators to actually have a serious conversation about this outside of entertainment. And it'll be more than just a podcast because we're gonna be able to take that information and we're gonna be able to apply that within the AIAA and have conversations about the technology and perhaps pursue that. If someone has a good idea and we have a conversation about it, we can go get things done. We don't mm. just have to talk about it. We have potentially the resources and the, the equipment and eventually the equipment and the people and the minds to actually start to solve this. And so we want to try to bring those together and have those conversations, both with pilots and the people that are going to be able to figure it out. That's powerful. Having somebody like you being able to sit down on a podcast and talk to some of your peers and some of the people that that you respect or some of the people that respect you in in this industry and not have it be wrapped around entertainment. Mm-hmm. But I do understand what you're saying. Like it is important to have a, an industry. There should be a big market on this niche because I mean that's how you fund things. That's true. That's mm-hmm. the market should be. No matter how it, it happens from the ground up, if it is some with some of this outlandish entertainment, I mean, that's the way that's the way naturally it has to evolve. That's the way that we're gonna attract money to the situation. Well, people, that's the way people like you, you know. It got me, yeah. Exactly. I mean, you know, I knew there was something there to talk about, but um 
the document I talked about being able to release within the AIAA, that's really what that's going to be centered around is being able to provide a broader understanding throughout industry of the science and the the sensing phenomenologies and things so that technology can be built. So to kind of answer your question, you know, like how do we get from there to where we want to be? We're getting there, right? We have, mm -hmm. we've created scientific organizations. They have been created to actually study this. Right. And what's going to happen from that is we're going to be putting out information and data and conclusions and results. And that is going to go directly into developing new and better technology that's going to help us understand this problem better. So we're there, we're getting there, we're establishing that. And when we look out in the wider scope of things, we see that Arrow and others are taking a whole of government approach on this. This isn't, you know, one department, one agency, one organization, one, you know, senator or congressman with a with a hobby. The whole of government is kind of wrapping itself into this so that uh, we can take that that whole approach and make sure that we're using all the resources we have as a nation to understand that. And that's what's happening now, whether people see it or not. We're we're building the stage, we're setting the stage. And I think this year we're going to see uh, a lot of activity on that stage. How many uh, how many episodes have you recorded of your of your podcast so far? Four. Four episodes. What kind of people have you had on there? Uh, we had Professor Gary Nolan. Uh, we're going to be airing that episode tomorrow, actually. Oh wow! Uh, and the rest or the other three were commercial and F eighteen pilots. Wow, that's amazing. And where 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 is it on YouTube or is it on Apple it, or? It, yeah, you can uh, merge point podcast on YouTube. You can also find us on mergepodcast.com uh, and you'll be able to find all the episodes starting tomorrow on there. And of course, it'll be on- uh, Starting tomorrow. Starting tomorrow. Oh, wow, that's yeah, amazing. good timing. This thing won't be released yet. We'll re release this uh, next Tuesday, whatever date that is. Cool. Um, yeah, so we're going to, I think, then we're going to be airing uh, about every two weeks now and then hopefully every week uh, with, you know, just constantly interviewing pilots because there's enough of them out there and they have the stories, you know, and they've been seeing this for a long time. And so- We'll have that conversation. Uh, and at the same time, we'll be bringing in scientists and not just, you know, I have a lot of respect for Gary Nolan, but he's pretty wrapped into this conversation. But I want to bring in some people that people that aren't aware of uh, that have been in the industry for 40 plus years that have now volunteered to help at the AIAA that mm -hmm. are really tackling this. Known entities, you know, known, you know, uh, I'll say senior uh, engineers uh, and scientists from across the aerospace industry are really getting around to put their might behind this in a public manner. And so we're going to see a lot of progress, I think, this year and in the future. Have you thought about what happens once, if and when this becomes just accepted public knowledge that there's, if there is another civilization that is, communi that is com trying to communicate or traveling here and monitoring us and that is here with us and we're not alone, like... If that does become common knowledge and accepted knowledge within the world and all the main governments in the world, have you thought about like what the implications of that are? What what are the public implications, and how does that affect wars and military? And yeah, I don't have an answer for that uh, entirely, but I will say that I know there are efforts underway uh, to form. Uh, certain organizations that will study this from a more broad perspective like that. Um, of course, within the AIAA, I'm focusing on science and engineering around this topic, uh, but I think we'll hear soon about some other efforts that consider, you know, the sociological implications of this, that uh, include the economic implications of this, the xenopolitical nature of this. But to kind of get to- What does that mean, xenopolitical? External politics. We okay. have to now consider something other than ourselves in our relationship with uh, you know, how we interact in the world, perhaps. Mm -hmm. How do we retain our agency if we do exist among, you know, highly technologically capable societies, right? I, that, I think that's really what it boils down to if we do come to terms with this is that how do we maintain our dignity and our sovereignty in such an environment? And I think, I think um, truly we have, well, I think that's what it boils down to really. How do we interface on perhaps a stage like that as the weaker candidate, but with the self-respect that we should have in order to operate at that level? Mm. Uh, these are the conversations and the questions I think that we'll be able to explore in a more organized manner once, once we kind of get past this this uncertainty phase. You know, this, it's very, there's so many more questions than there are uh, answers. That's, that's going to be that. the fun part. <sighs> Can't wait. I mean, it's, it's scary. It's scary to think about what could happen because obviously, you know, human the human mind goes to all the fear first like what could the worst what would the worst case scenario be if the public knew that 
okay, that we're not everything. There's other beings here. Would the economy collapse? Would what would happen to religion? Like, it's it's I think unfathomable. We'll okay. It's I, unfathomable. I think we will do okay. I really do. I think that one of the reasons that perhaps this is an okay time for this is that our society is uh, measured in some sense right now by how fast we change how fast our technology advances. And we see it all the time. Our society and our, our social standards don't necessarily keep up with the technology. Our technology right. is created yeah. and then we try to find a way to live with it in a sense. I don't think this is gonna be much different in a sense. I think as long as we can retain our agency and our self-respect in a manner like we were just talking about, that we're gonna be able to integrate that information because really that's just, you know, that's how the modern person lives right now. Every year there's new technology and, and something different. Um, not to mention the, the state of the world in some sense with COVID and everything else that's been going on. I think people's comfort in reality has been shook a little bit by mm -hmm. the events of the past five to eight years. And if you did want to introduce some drastically different knowledge, I would suggest that this would probably be a good time as mm -hmm. the shock would be lessened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am optimistic about it to an extent, just you know, hearing some of the stories. It doesn't seem like these things, if they are from a different, civilization are a threat to us. It doesn't seem like they are here for bad. They don't have any, any mal intentions, especially when you hear, you know, some of the most fascinating things to me is, is how there's been a large number of sightings near schools and, you know, with young children seeing these things and reporting these things. And I don't know if you're familiar with the, uh, the, the Zimbabwe, the Rua school in Zimbabwe back in the early nineties, mm -hmm. there was something that landed and there was like 30 or 40 school children that all witnessed the same exact thing. And there was, a, uh, that famous Harvard psychiatrist who interviewed them all and Mac. Yeah. Yeah. John Mack. And, uh, you know, there was communications. They said that when they stared into the eyes of these things, that they felt this feeling of, be careful with technology. Technology can lead you down a dark path or it could be bad for your civilization. You know. Probably not the thoughts that these children were having. <laughs> probably not a natural thought yeah. that these children would be having. Yeah. Especially during that time in the early 90s. I mean, looking at where the world was then. Um, and then, you know, there were so many school sightings like this, which is, is very interesting to me how... You know, because when you think of children, how much more open-minded they are than adults who are just hardwired into thinking the world is a certain way. Um, that that alone just makes me whether how real that is or not. That makes me optimistic about this whole thing. Mm -hmm. And I'll say too that I don't think what we're experiencing is probably a new phenomenon. Uh, I think that would uh, be a statistical unlikeliness, or mm -hmm. be unlikely statistically to think that this just started in the very recent past. Um, I, I, I work from the assumption that this has probably been going on much longer than that. Mm -hmm. Although I, you know, what that means in my daily thinking, I don't know, but, mm -hmm. um, I don't think this is new. And if we, if we, if we assume that, then, um, I don't think we can, as we have to have that much to fear as we better understand this because we're already living in that world. We just don't know it. Right. So the fear is all just our own internal change that we need to come to terms with. Yeah. These stories like this, it's, there's only two things you can really do with it in a sense. You can accept it or you can not. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people choose the latter, uh, like maybe perhaps as a school teacher, because it's almost like a cognitive dissonance mm. in a sense where you just, you cannot process that information and continue about in your normal life immediately. And so your brain just kind of dismisses it as either confusion or temporary yeah. stupidity or what have you yeah. and go about their lives. And I've noticed that in this conversation that I've been having more broadly about this topic, sometimes there's just people that, and you, one of the best ways you can identify them is as soon as you mention something, quote unquote, aliens or just different or UAP, folks, just immediate laughter, right? It's like a, the, the first reaction is a ha, you know, like, a, and then they like realize you're not laughing and, and then they kind of like, oh, okay. But they don't know how to move forward from that point because they're not ready to integrate that into their reality yet. I truly think people really do live in their own realities, yeah. right? You create your you create your perception of the world in your brain, right? And you do that based on your experiences, whether mm -hmm. they're true or not, right? Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of times I think people use that uh, kind of mentality to protect themselves from this type of information almost as a protection 
uh, mechanism where it's just too outside, you know, their scope of every day for them to really like just stop and integrate it because it's just too much. Right. It's too much. And and we're busy. Yeah. We're busy. We got shit to do. Yeah. Right. Like it's almost the same thing that you dealt with in the Navy in a way. Oh, a hundred percent. It's exactly the same way. We got missions to do. We got this, we got that. I want to promote. I want to do this. You know, I want to eventually get home and see my wife. And right. People are just so focused on their day-to-day -day lives and what they have to do in the next hour and staring at their phones on social media. I mean, like, and we were, I mean, that was even true for us as fighter pilots when we were literally in the sky looking at these objects, right? <laughs> <laughs> Which bad on us, but you know, we only have so much fuel and X, Y, and Z. And there's a lot yeah. of reasons why that is the best, you know, that was the right answer. Of course. Yeah. But it doesn't prevent me from looking back with a little bit of regret, wondering what we could have learned if we paid more attention at the time. Mm-hmm. Well, cool, man. I really appreciate you coming and doing this. This was fascinating. Yeah, it was my pleasure. It was great. Thanks for having Tell me. Tell people again where they can find your new podcast and uh, and whatever else that you have online people can follow to learn more about you. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, look, there it is. There it is. The Merge, Merge Podcast. podcast. Uh, Merge Point Podcast on YouTube or mergepodcast.com. Uh, we're going to start airing our first episode tomorrow. It'll already be out by the time you hear this. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter at Uncertain Vector. And uh, yeah. I can't wait for you guys to see it. That's incredible. How'd you come up with the name Merged? Well, that's how we saw these things, right? We have a merge with them. A merge is a fighter pilot term when you get close enough to an object to visually ID it because you're uncertain of its origin or its makeup. And so we go to merges and dogfights all the time. And that's when we go nose on, we get as close as we can, we merge plot, which means the radar operators can no longer distinguish our, our, our radar contacts. Oh. on their scope anymore. So we've merged into one radar contact. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, and so that's, that's how we visually ID things. Appreciate it again, man. Thank you. And uh, good night, world. Good night. <laughs>